Uh, Andrea, I would just ask you to to email Pogaknik uh, because uh, I cannot uh, really focus on his case now. Otherwise, we'll never begin. Um, um, Pogaknik is not there. I, I'll try to email him, but uh, I don't I'll know send that. you. I'll send you his. his uh, no, I don't have his phone number. Um, okay. I will. I will begin because otherwise we will run too late, and I think we're going to have a very intense afternoon now. Um, so first of all, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people and the institutions that made this event possible. Uh, so first of all, of course, the University of Bologna, and particularly the PhD program Architecture and Design Cultures. But I will also uh, thank the Collège International de Philosophie, uh, of which I am one of the directors, and uh, the college supports this the, this event. Uh, I would also thank, of course, Andrea Borsari, you uh, you've met now, and Annalisa Trentin. Um, so I just wanted to say a few words about about this event and the choice to discuss uh, Red Vienna and Red Berlin with a big question mark. Uh, next to uh, Red Berlin. Uh, Andrea, can you switch off your micro? Um, there are at least two reasons why uh, I think uh, these two uh, topics are particularly relevant. Well, first of all, I think uh, Red Berlin. Why Red Berlin? Well, because uh, the rent cap that became a law uh, in January uh, has gone virtually unnoticed outside of Germany. Well, and this is, uh, we know why, because basically starting from February, uh, the world has begun to look elsewhere. And so uh, the reason uh, there's been, you know, very little attention to this, to what is in my view, very uh, relevant and interesting and, and promising uh, political measure. Um, of course, in Germany, things have been quite different. There's been a significant debate. But as I said, outside of Germany, very, very few of us uh, have heard of uh, the rent cap and this attempt to freeze the rents in Berlin, which has become a law. Uh, as I said, um, it's the, the constitutional court will decide whether this measure, this law, is constitutional. Uh, the decision was initially scheduled to take place basically now, at the end of November, but uh, in fact it's been postponed. So it's still, uh, uh, you know, it's still, it's still something we need to, to, we can talk about, it's still a potential uh, measure. Uh, and this is the first reason, and I think it's, it's crucial uh, to have, and I'm very pleased to have Valentina Rioli among the speakers today, Valentina is not only um, a member of staff at the University of Bologna, but also the vice mayor of the city. And she is uh, in charge of the city planning. So she is a you know, very important figure in this regard. And I think we all want her to, to listen to what's going on in, in Berlin at the moment. Um, but there's a second reason, I would say, uh, for this event today, well, the connection between Red Berlin, or rather the um, Rand Cap in Berlin, and Red Vienna. Uh, and I think Red Vienna is one of the most advanced and interesting examples of uh, socialist moni moni municipalism, I would say. Uh, so it's, it's it's an event, uh, it's a quite unique experience of, of, of large-scale social housing projects in Europe. And I think this is extremely relevant today, or at least this is what some of the campaigners for the RAND cap in Berlin uh, think. And in fact, they refer to Red Vienna as a sort of uh, example 
Um, and I think this is this is quite interesting. I think the speakers today will show the differences between uh, a sort of militant approach to a historical example and a more scholarly approach. Uh, in other words, uh, a militant or an activist uh, referring back to Red Vienna is not doing the same thing as a historian of architecture uh, referring to or looking at Red Vienna. And I think these two different approaches are extremely relevant. They're not incompatible, or at least this is what I think, what I hope. And I think today we will possibly have both of them. And, you know, this are virtually two different uh, epistemologies. You know, what, what do we think, what do we do with history? How do we mobilize history to act in the present? And I think this is one of the kind of underlying topics uh, today. Um, but of course, um, it is my hope that we will be able to discuss issues of migration, gentrification uh, in Berlin today, which is, uh, of course, an extremely relevant topic also for Bologna. Um, I think we have really an ideal group to discuss these uh, issues. We have uh, a political activist, we have historians, we have, um, you know, people working uh, or having a prominent position within uh, the city council. We have, and of course, some of our speakers are both of them. Uh, uh, I think, for example, of Gabu uh, Heidel, who will join us possibly in half an hour, who is both a uh, an architect, an historian, possibly an activist. So I think this is, we have a really interesting uh, admixture of expertise and, 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 and skills. Uh, I just want to say a few words about the structure of the event. Uh, we'll have three talks. Uh, so Mati, Matthias Clausen, Ezra Akan, and Marco Pogaknik. Uh, then we'll have a break, um, and then we'll reconvene for two more talks uh, by uh, Gabu Hande and Valentino Rioli. At the end of the event, we'll have a um, we'll open the floor, and we'll have a, a you know a, a hopefully very engaging discussion with the speakers, but of course uh, with the audience as well. Uh, there are about a hundred people now connected. Hopefully they'll stay with us till about six. Um, right, now I think we can begin with um, Mati. Mati, are you with us? Can you activate your micro? I activated my micro and my cam. Can you see me? Ah, you have to see Screen share, yes, but you yeah, can hear me. Thank you, Mate. Right. Do you have a PowerPoint, Mate? There are maybe some things I'd like to show, yes. Okay. Uh, so I think we need Andrea uh, because we've had PowerPoint issues. Uh, we should sort this out in a second. Uh, Andrea, can you can you hear us? Yeah, I have authorized Matthew to as a as a oh, yeah. speaker, so he should be able to uh, to share his powerpoints as other people speaking later. Okay, Andrea, very quick question. Uh, okay, Mar Marco Pogacnik has joined us, right? Yeah, it's just brilliant. I'm here. I'm here. Ciao, Marco. Ciao. You thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. It's been it's been more difficult than expected. I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, Matti, you have the floor. Uh, thanks, Jacopo, and thank you uh, for the invitation. I'm uh, honored to represent our our movement. You can say here, and uh, also that there is this kind of interest for uh, for what we do over the last. 10 years or so in Berlin in regard to the question Marty, of writing. Yes? Uh, I, I forgot to introduce you. I'm very sorry about that. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm you know, yeah, connected well, to... Exactly what those uh, were uh, writing outlets, to you. Uh, so, sorry for that. Um, 
I just, uh, you know, I have to keep in mind a quite a few things. Uh, so Marty, uh, Matthias, his name is actually Matthias Clausen, is a long-term militant of the Interventionistische Linke, which is an anti-capitalist organization in Germany, active in Germany and uh, Austria. Uh, is also part of the working group called Ride to the City, which is, of course, reference to uh, Henri Lefebvre, uh, which is the kind of uh, working group looking at uh, city planning within the interventionist Linke. But Matt is also a member of Kotlin Co, a tenants uh, initiative and a low income neighborhood fight for affordable social rents. Uh, and against racism. Um, but Matty, this is not in his bio, but I, I know that he's also um, live in in some of the areas that are, you know, uh, um, that will be discussed today, possibly by, by Ezra Khan, so the uh, Kreuzberg and, and Kokosa. Matty, sorry for that again, so please. And uh, no problem. I I I, uh, I would have <laughs> would have talked about that uh, too. It's um, I have a I have a complicated task now because there's so much to say. It's about uh, we have this meet and decker, the rent cap. We have a referendum on um, the expropriation of landlords, private landlords with more than three thousand flats in Berlin. Uh, and uh, I have this double membership of interventionist left and my uh, lovely tenants initiative, Kati and Co. Um, um, yeah, but I will try my best to, uh, to keep it focused. I will not uh, explain the whole situation. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the fact that there is some kind of struggle around housing in Berlin, uh, like in other cities. And um, yeah, and, and, uh, and I am part of that since 2011. Um, I'm a social tenant. Uh, I live in social housing. Uh, can you see my, my, my camera at the moment? Okay. Yeah, I... we can see you, Ma. We can see we can see your room and, and yeah, we can see you, Ma. Uh, now your PowerPoint. Yeah. This is this is our neighborhood. It's social housing in the center of Berlin. And um, uh, yeah, and we have this initiative here. I will not talk about that too much because as Akchan, I think we'll talk about migration and Kreuzberg and the uh, history of migration here and the um, mainstream reality of a migrant society that is still ignored by, uh, by some very important people. <laughs> Um, instead, I will uh, yeah, focus on, on, on what we do with Interventionist Left and, uh, and this concept that we have that is called uh, Das Rote Berlin. A few years ago, we published this brochure. Uh, it's about a strategy towards a socialist city, and of course, it references uh, the, uh, uh, the Red Vienna. I will uh, try to share my uh, screen. Uh, Yes, share this, please. Um, oh, no, this is not what I wanted to show now. Um, where, let me, I have too many. Uh, Matt, yeah, we can, we can see your screen now. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm a member of this anti-capitalist group. We are in around 30 cities in, in Germany and a little bit in Austria. Um, we do not only do right to the city stuff, we block coal industry with Ende Gelände, we <laughs> fight for healthcare, we block the European Central Bank, and we do demonstrations on the expropriation of large housing companies. Um, I'm also a member of Koti and Co. You see it here. Uh, this is our little group in our neighborhood. Um, I will not talk about this because it's too much. What I want to talk about is, is a problem, um, not because uh, I think you don't know about it, but just to, to um, tell you what our perspective on it is. And that uh, is that, uh, especially since unification, since 1990, uh, there's a change what flats are, how they are used. It's the, their primary use is not anymore uh, accommodation or maybe to save money 
as your household if you buy it or if you invest in, in, in owning a flat. But it became a form of finance capital uh, that suits especially well uh, the demands of the current situation, of the current crisis. You want to have uh, your capital saved in a safe space that is relatively decoupled from the production sphere because production is very prone to crisis at the moment. So you want to have a place where uh, it can accumulate um, more or less independently of that because everyone has to pay rent regardless if they're unemployed. Uh, you want to uh, have it uh, fixed for long term and uh, maybe also in a very basic necessity and everyone has to live somewhere. So uh, it's a pretty safe heaven. And, um, and this is the reason why there was a, and still is a huge run on, especially on Berlin um, real estate. Uh, and it's, it's, it's still going on and it uh, became absolutely crazy in the, in the amount of, of, of money that circulates here. Uh, on a practical day-to-day -day level, we see this, uh, of course, with the rents. 86% of Berliners live in, in uh, live as, as, as tenants, and um, so this almost doubling of the rents is uh, is a real problem because <laughs> unexpectedly our income didn't double in these years. Um, but you also see this little sign of hope when you see this uh, 2019, this very last number. Um, and you see the problem even better if you look not only at the rent, but also this is the blue line in this um, in this uh, graph. But especially if you see it in regard to the income, uh, there you see this delta that uh, yeah expresses that we pay more and more of our income every year for the rent, and the sales prices for flats they go absolutely crazy. Uh, it's only it's only 10 years that you see here and it's almost tripled in in price and this is of course uh, the speculation with future incomes maybe after you kicked out the current tenants uh, and uh, replaced them with higher income uh, people so there's a strong pressure to realize these investments and to to um yeah to not only buy and sell houses for even uh, for uh, bigger and bigger prices, but also to realize these prices so the bubble doesn't burst. In 2010, we started a new cycle of struggle around this housing question. It was a to big topic long as almost since World War II, but uh, in the last 10 years, it became uh, the housing question became uh, gained momentum in a way that it didn't in the years before. And the foundation of that was always tenants initiatives like Koti and Co, and uh, they are still the driving force behind this movement. This is super important. It's not by, run by parties or other organizations. It's run by these kind of initiatives. And um, around that time, uh, EL developed an analysis and thought, okay, housing is a key question, uh, not only in, in, in the social struggles that we are living in, but also in this economical view, in this view on, on the accumulation process, it's a super important sector and um, and we should think about uh, what what would be um, perspectives in this sector uh, and how can we support these initiatives and the movement. So we uh, we wrote this this brochure, Das Rote Berlin. Um, and uh, of course, this refers to Red Vienna in the sense that uh, we also talk about a radical reformistic, one could say social democrat in the best sense program um, that puts social infrastructure first. Uh, of course, Red Vienna was not only about housing, but also about um, all other kinds of social infrastructure, childcare, hospitals, and so on. And uh, it was financed by letting the rich pay. And this is exactly the opposite of what we have now. Now it is letting the poor pay and not for putting social infrastructure first, but for putting social infrastructure into finance markets. So uh, uh, in this sense, uh, we, uh, we are referring to this historical example. Um, and uh, we... Uh, Ah, maybe, and there's also one, uh, another point uh, that Red Vienna um, also, I mean, in the end, it failed. Uh, it was over, uh, it was overthrown by the Austro-Fascist uh, government, 
and uh, maybe it also demonstrates the limit of local statehood, of local agency um, towards these big questions. Uh, I mean, we are talking about global processes and the capacity of local state to um, regulate that or to articulate their agency in, in, this, in this process is limited. And uh, in the end, maybe it was also a failure in political strategy. Maybe it was too hesitant. Um, I'm not an historian, so I hope we will get answers to that later. Um, yes, we have three main uh, demands, um, or three main topics in, 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 in this uh, regard. Let me stop this sharing, because uh, this was all that I wanted to show for the moment. Um, first, push back private housing market, second, expand the non-profit sector, and third, uh, more democracy in the public housing sector. And the idea is that the private housing, uh, private housing actors almost never are part of the solution. Um, the hegemonic idea is that uh, the state should subsidize certain investments and guarantee a certain profit maybe for, I don't know, social housing or something, and um, gearing the capital flow in certain directions. And um, especially in social housing in Berlin, what is a crazy subsidy and tax avoiding scheme, um, but also in, in a lot of other regards, this, in our opinion, proved to be a catastrophic strategy. And um, we should do instead everything to make housing and real estate unattractive for private capital. May it be strong tenants rents, may it be uh, taxes, especially on, on, on gains in selling houses or ground, uh, high taxes on, uh, uh, yeah, on, on selling ground or, or the, the annual tax on it. Uh, all of this kind of stuff or, or to make it un allocatable. Uh, if you modernize uh, a house, you cannot put the, uh, put the cost on the tenants. Uh, to forbid share deals where you don't buy and sell houses, but you buy and sell companies that own houses, so you avoid the tax. All of this kind of stuff uh, should be uh, made as unattractive as possible for private capital. This is the first step. The second one is, of course, to expand the nonprofit sector to put more money in nationalization and, cons and public construction, uh, to uh, forbid privatization as we experienced so bad in Berlin and other cities. And uh, of course, uh, to uh, think about expropriation. We have a very uh, interesting article in our constitution that allows for exactly this. So uh, we should do this. And third, democratize public housing. There's, it's complicated how public housing is organized in Berlin. There are some participation and um, democratic institutions or, or, or processes uh, implemented. This is by far not enough. A lot is happening behind closed doors. Um, and we want full disclosure of the company data, including the contracts and the privatization contracts. We need the introduction of self-management models that, of course, always have to be voluntary. There's an initiative. Uh, public and self-managed um, and it's uh, about a like a modular system where tenants can see what kind of self-management they want to do um, stuff like this um, so these are the three steps that we propose with um, Das Rote Berlin um, Currently, we are very much involved in, uh, in a referendum, in a citywide referendum uh, about the expropriation of private landlords uh, with more than 3,000 flats. We don't know exactly how many flats that are because the ownership is hidden in a lot of uh, uh, cases, but it will be around two, uh, 240,000 flats of the 1.5 million flats that we have in Berlin. And this is based on an article in our constitution. Uh, it, it's coming from this from the early years of uh, of West Germany uh, when there was still it was still not really settled in what direction economically West Germany would go. And it says, land, natural resources, and means of production may, for the purpose of nationalization, 
be transferred to public ownership or other forms of public enterprise by a law that determines the nature and extent of compensation. This never happened ever since 49. And um, there's a lot of expropriation for highways or something like this, but never for this, uh, for this purpose. So uh, we are, we are uh, exploring new shores uh, legally, but uh, the vast majority of the, uh, of the legal experts agree that this is absolutely possible and the compensation can be significantly below market value because otherwise the purpose of the expropriation would be countered, of course. So uh, we talk about uh, an, an compensation that can be refinanced in 20 to 30 years uh, only by the, by the incoming rent. So uh, it, uh, effectively it, it would not cost money on the long run. Of course, now there would be huge credits to, to take. Um, this, um, this referendum has a lot of, of popularity at the moment in Berlin. And uh, we are right at the beginning of the second phase where we have to collect signatures. We have to collect, a, uh, let's say, 200,000 um, uh, signatures, more or less. And uh, we will do this beginning in February. And in September, there will be the uh, election where the Berliners can vote to do that. It's a broad alliance, mainly of individuals. And this all is based on these kind of initiatives and of years of organizing we have 10 years of struggle behind us that we came to this moment. So it's nothing that uh, just popped into our minds. First official reaction to this was to, uh, to, to the announcement by our mayor. They wanted to buy back the whole uh, GSV, the, the company that was privatized earlier where I live. So 65,000 flats should be bought back from Deutsche Wohnen. Deutsche Wohnen is uh, the biggest private landlord in Germany. It was never heard of again, but uh, it was obvious that there is a certain level of panic now on the other side, especially if, if at that time, I think 70% uh, of Berliners agreed with our, with our uh, claim. Um, the second reaction was rent caps. This was originally a social democrat idea, but the socialist party was also part of the, of the coalition, um, adapted it, and in the end it became a law. Uh, with the help also of lawyers that are part of the movement. This rent cap will introduce, I will show it to you, I have to share the screen again, I guess. Uh, this rent cap will introduce, um, based on a, certain, on a certain table that you can see here, it depends on, on, the, on the level of, of your facilities and then some other stuff how much money maximum uh, the landlord can take from you. And it's also effective for already existing contracts. After a few months of, uh, of being in effect, uh, the second level now uh, started to be effective. Uh, and the second level is that if existing rents are more than 20% above these limits, they have not only have, cannot uh, increase anymore, but they will have to be kept. They will have to go down. And this affects 340,000 flats in Berlin. There was uh, a calculation that 21 million euros are, uh, is the uh, accumulated rent that, is, that cannot be collected because of rent cap. Um, this is, of course, a huge win by uh, the uh, tenants' movement in general and this referendum in, uh, especially. But at the same time, it was always meant as a, as a way to, to stop this referendum. Uh, here you see uh, newspapers talking about this. The day it was, it was announced, here you have uh, uh, Lomscher, our uh, uh, senator on housing at that time. And uh, it said is a notoriously right-wing yellow press saying crazy plan against crazy rents. And uh, here again, pro and con. It is a huge fight and still is. There were big campaigns by, um, by the housing industry against it and uh, apocalyptic uh, images uh, that Berliners are now going completely crazy. And we have uh, East German socialist GDR 
uh, situations in Berlin will be in ruins in a few years. It's, uh, it's a pretty polarized discourse at the moment. Uh, what we did at the same time was to say this is great, but it's not enough. We had this demonstration, uh, rent cap for real and then expropriate. And it's, uh, it's, the, the reasons are it's only for five years. And expropriation is, is for, for your whole life. Uh, it's, it's legally pretty tough. It's actually uh, more disputed than expropriation because there already exist on federal level rent regulation laws. So the local level cannot uh, regulate things that the federal level already did. Um, so it's disputed and we will see in the second quarter of next year uh, if this really um, if this can really rem remain. Um, yeah, and uh, and of course it makes this whole uh, renationalization program, buying houses and to, to expand the public housing sector, it makes it uh, very expensive because you have to uh, do this on the agreement by the, by the private owner and uh, of course for market value. So um, this is something uh, that we say is worse than our solution and uh, I mean, it's not in conflict. You can first do the rent cap and then do the expropriation. I think this is a wonderful combination. But um, in the end, it was uh, it was meant as a as a measure to to counter this referendum. In the moment, it is in effect. There are a lot of co all co new contracts have a so-called shadow rent. This is uh, in astronomical rent usually that uh, comes into effect if the rent cap is not legal. Uh, so this will be a very interesting moment uh, next year when the decision by the Federal Constitutional Court is made. Um, and yeah, this is, the, this is the situation. Next year, uh, we will have kind of a showdown, not only what this rent cap, uh, uh, not in, only in, in regard to this rent cap, but also uh, with this referendum. Um, and the last thing that I want to say is, um, we have over the last couple of uh, of years this municipalist idea it became pretty popular in berlin too we have at the moment a coalition of social democrats socialist and green party in the government and especially the green party is very fond of the idea of participation and so on and um and we have first attempts to demo to put more de democracy into public housing and there are some activists who are now working uh, for the local government in different levels and um, and we have also institutions put in place by the government that should facilitate the interaction between movement and politics it's a double-sided sword i'm um, in a way it eases the symbolic recognition of our demands. It is in effect since four years, this government, and um, as you saw with these graphs, it was not a, they were not able to uh, resolve the housing question. And I'm not sure if, um, if the strategic situation now is that much better than it was uh, when the when the confrontation was a little bit more obvious, because right now um, it also, uh, of course, affects our capacity to respond to political instruments that are geared to uh, against tenants. Um, if you are in this close relationship to the local government, it's hard to, it's not as easy to fiercely attack where you would have to do that. And um, the official parliamentary politics is always oriented towards compromise and towards um, a solution that keeps everyone silent. And movements are always geared towards conflict. And these contradicting logics are hard to mediate in these kind of municipalist attempts that we have here in Berlin. Municipalism is uh, th something that is very strong here in Kreuzberg, where the district is, uh, is in, in favor of this idea. On a Berlin-wide level, it's not as strong. Um, 
So I, I, I wouldn't say that Berlin at the moment is a laboratory for municipalism like Barcelona is, for example, but, um, but there are attempts in this direction. I would say this is a sign how strong we are, but uh, it always has to be taken with a, with a pinch of salt, I guess. This is uh, maybe everything for the moment. I think I did not take too much time. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much. It was very clear, uh, but I'm sure I can probably activate my camera, but I'm sure there will be questions because you mentioned quite a few things, referendum, the law, what happens next year. So if uh, maybe we will ask some questions also just, just to clarify some of the main the main points. But uh, I think we can move on to the second speaker now and, and we'll gather the questions uh, at the end, um, at the end of the day for the discussion. The second speaker is Ezra Akan, uh, who is uh, Michael McCarthy Professor of Architectural Theory uh, and Director of European Studies at the Einaudi Center for International Studies at Cornell University. His scholarly work explores critical and post-colonial theory, immigration, issues of translation, racism, architecture, photo architectural photography, neoliberalism, and global history. Uh, she has published extensively uh, on um, uh, several topics. I, I will mention only a couple of her books. Turkey, Modern Architectures in History, um, Building in Exile, Bruno Taut in Turkey, Intertwined Histories of Living and Learning, and uh, a book, well, I, I, I would say uh, my favorite book, and I would strong, strongly recommend it, is uh, Open Architecture, Migration, Citizenship, and the Urban Urban Renewal of Berlin Kreuzberg, which came out in 2018. Um, and she's currently writing a book whose title is extremely interesting and, and, and seemingly very um, important for our time, A Right to Heal, Architecture and Post-Conflict and Post-Disaster Societies. I wonder whether uh, the post-pandemic situation will also be part of a uh, book. Ezra, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. So you have the floor. You, you uh, I mean, I, I would I would stick to Matty's model. So uh, yeah, when, when, you, when you show us your PowerPoint, just show us your PowerPoint. When you talk, maybe you can uh, activate your camera. Okay. So I activated my camera. Um, you can see you, yeah. Okay, um, screen one, share. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Um, is it, does it have my... Um, the title. Like the title, okay, great. Yeah. And now this other um image right yeah everything seems to work okay great so well thank you so much for uh inviting me uh and i'm re really looking forward to, to the uh, conversation uh so i'll just go ahead and um make a presentation um so among the many issues that have occupied berliners minds in the last two years i would say two seemingly unrelated phenomena stand out uh, the rising rents uh, and the refugee arrival spaces. Both have a stake in Berlin's place in local and global imagination uh, as a city more affordable for renters uh, and more hospitable to refugees than many other locations of its caliber. At least it was uh, like that so far. Uh, what is often overlooked, however, uh, is the intertwined struggle for these two causes uh, in order to make Berlin both affordable and hospitable, while the omnipresent forces of global uh, and national ruling powers pull the city in the opposite direction. So I hope my uh, slides are advancing. Um, 
So as I was doing research uh, for what would become my book, Open Architecture, um, I rang the doorbell of every single apartment uh, in Berlin's Kreuzberg to ask if uh, the immigrant residents would be interested in joining an oral history project about the urban renewal of their neighborhood in the 1980s. I also observed during this time that Berlin was turning from a city that was accessible to people with little means, including immigrants, refugees, students, artists, artisans, authors, uh, into a city whose authorities aspired to make it attractive to multinational investors. During the time span that covered the research and writing of this book, uh, I would say be between 2019 and uh, 17, sorry, 2009 and 17. So during this time span, I had to rent apartments myself that exponentially got more and more expensive every year. So one of the sad paradoxes in this situation from the perspective of an architect and planner uh, is that Berlin had been exemplary in providing affordable housing to its residents for years. My book, Open Architecture, was an account on one of these public housing initiatives known as EBA 1984-87. Uh, this was an international building exhibition, uh, which was justifiably one of the most important architectural events of its time and a microcosm of international architectural debates from the mid-1960s till the early 1990s. So this initiative differed from its precedents by treating public housing or social housing as a renewal of the city. So an astonishingly large number, about 200 cutting edge and established architectural offices from Europe and the United States were invited to contribute to design social housing here, including uh, all the names you say here, Eisenman, Gregotti, Hadid, Heida, Kersberger, Koloff, Kolas, Rossi, Ungers, and so on. But also many other uh, important but understudied professionals uh, were part of this initiative whose due acknowledgement is hopeful, hopefully given uh, with, with my book. So rather than emptying the site uh, of rundown structures to make room for new buildings, or rather than building these mega housing projects as in the immediate past, uh, IBA uh, advocated a policy that would critically reconstruct and gently renew Berlin's historical structure made up of perimeter blocks. So it was a street courtyard based housing scheme rather than other types of housing such as freestanding buildings in nature, row houses and so on. As a result of this, uh, as a result, this urban renewal as social housing produced a number of variations of the perimeter block typology in order to demonstrate the potentials and livability of an urban fabric of streets and courtyards. What is additionally striking about this urban renewal is that it took place in Rundown Kreuzberg, uh, the German Harlem, as some newspapers called it. Uh, it had a population composed uh, in some areas of almost 50% immigrants, non-citizens, uh, predominantly from Turkey, who had arrived as guest workers since 19. 61, and as refugees uh, due to the coup d'etat and subsequent violence in Turkey since 1980. So, however, uh, this urban renewal with uh, social housing operated in the context of the Berlin Senate's discriminatory housing laws and regulations against immigrants at the time. These regulations included a ban uh, on immigrants uh, moving to Kreuzberg and a 10% quota for immigrant residency in any given building all over West Berlin. And these laws were translated into uh, the new buildings uh, as the functional program by way of controlling the number of big flats. Uh, so according to social Democrat, Democrats at the time, these regulations were justified as an quote unquote integration of foreigners uh, into German society by their forced dispersal even throughout the city. Moreover, as you see in the quote in the slide, uh, midway through the realization, Berlin's Senate uh, was won by Christian Democrats who employed anti-immigration policies. These programs, in other words, would either diminish immigrant families' chances to move into the new social housing buildings or welcome them only if they change their lives to fit the ger German family size standards, only if they were uh, smaller uh, families, in other words. 
So in, in the book, I criticize the architect's cooperation uh, with these anti-immigration policies, but I also try to, to locate some of the inspiring subversive examples uh, that I'll uh, speak about today in order to make a player for what I called open architecture to come. And let me briefly introduce uh, what I mean by open architecture. Um, so the word open has justifiably become a common metaphor today as people, artifacts, capital, images, information travel from one place to another. Uh, not so much people at this moment, but uh, in the very immediate past and hopefully in the future. Uh, but the theoretical implications uh, or historical background uh, and the contradictions of this word open remain unexplored. So in the history of architecture, there was no shortage of transformative modern ground plans that created some definition of open plan in the early 20th century. During the 1950s and 60s, open societies, anticipation of change, mobility and adaptability of form, as well as endless individualist choices, ever expanding lifestyle possibilities, these became common mottos of a new generation of architects. So in the introduction of the book, I give a short history of projects uh, towards an open architecture throughout the 20th century. But the chapters uh, pick up the history of latent open architecture at a point in the mid 1960s, when a number of architects started questioning uh, the individualist ethos. So uh, in my book, I define openness as a foundational modern value uh, that has nonetheless been subject to contradictions. And I define open architecture as a translation of a new ethics of hospitality into architecture. So the book asks, what would have happened if the architectural discipline and profession were shaped by a new ethics of hospitality towards the refugee, towards the immigrants? So it brings together projects toward an open architecture that could be based on collectivity and collaboration, participation and democratic design, multiplicity of meaning. So in my mind, open architecture is predicated on the welcoming of a distinctly other mind or a group of minds into the process of architectural design. It seeks for the expansion of human rights and social citizenship, but it goes against the grain of neoliberal ethos of the open market that closes boundaries for the majority. So this term supports collab collaboration, but it is not synonymous with uh, closed clubs. Uh, this definition of openness is related more to open borders than the open market. Uh, it's related to collectivity than individuality, the openness of society than the free circulation of consumer projects, products. So, and my theme, uh, overarching theme, is the current human rights regime that impaired uh, the guest workers and refugees' right to have rights, uh, and therefore exposed the very limits of these past forms of open architecture. Uh, so the book conceptualizes uh, the non-citizen or the stateless uh, as a limit condition that exposes the insufficiencies of our human rights regime as it still goes on, because the definition of human rights still today is preconditioned on being a citizen of a nation state. That is why, for instance, Georgia Agamben revisited Hannah Arendt's text, We Refugees. The current human rights regime impairs the immigrants' rights to have rights and turns them into what Agamben calls bare life. Namely, the states hold the power to deprive citizens of their political rights and push them outside the realm that should have been protected by citizenship rights. Ever since his first declaration, natural and civil rights, birth and nationhood, these have been collapsed into each other in such a way that makes citizenship the necessary condition to have human rights. Consequently, this denies, this situation denies many rights to, uh, to immigrants. So the Berlin Senate, for instance, could pass discriminatory renting regulations at the time, such as the ban on entry or the quota for migrants that could occupy a building, because uh, the migrants were not protected by citizenship rights. The migrants' right to the city, in other words, such as their right to move freely, to choose their neighborhood, to have equal opportunity in renting an apartment, to move into a building where they could find the support of social and cultural networks, these were taken away from them with the assumption that their immigrant status justified this violation. 
So in my mind, the urban renewal of Kreuzberg exposes the historical consequences of this human rights paradox as it reflects on housing and urbanism. And unlike conventional architectural histories, I think this topic requires giving voice not only to architects and policymakers, but also to immigrants. So methodologically, for that reason, I tried to uh, explore an open form of writing and uh, employed uh, a lot of oral history and storytelling in uh, trying to understand this history. Um, Ezra, yes. maybe you can, you can hide a small window at the bottom of your screen. You see, there's a, there's a small window. Uh, I... Teams, Hi. Microsoft. Ah, perfect. Great. That, that was okay. it. Thank you. Great. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, so let me talk about the more inspiring uh, group among this uh, project. So uh, this group, the Iba Altbau section, uh, was uh, working uh, in the, um, under the directorship of Hart Walter Hammer. Uh, so even though uh, Hammer uh, had an engaging architectural practice, uh, the model renovation of Block 118 in Berlin Charlottenburg in 1973 uh, earned him his reputation. At the time when the areas composed of these 19th century rental buildings were perceived as unhealthy and unusable, uh, Hammer argued for their importance in Berlin's history. Uh, so the pilot project uh, in Charlottenburg falsified the established opinions about contemporary urban renewal. It proved that restoring a war-torn building costed only 62% of the cost of demolishing it and building something new. It proved that residents did not need to be displaced due to urban renewal and that the rents increased only two-thirds with a restored building as opposed to constructing a new one. So the... Um, so the fact that the rents would increase only two thirds uh, if um, Berlin Senate's raise and build policies were aborted uh, became a very important uh, part uh, of uh, urban renewal uh, of EBA. Uh, so at the time, 60,000 entitled families were waiting for social housing. Uh, and this uh, project uh, that was at, uh, at uh, the table at the time, uh, which would have uh, dislocated 150,000 apartments uh, was anything but a solution. Uh, so in contrast to such top-down projects uh, or conventional city planning, Hammer coined his approach as gentle urban renewal. In explaining his struggle, he stated that he had to fight against the expectations of the politicians who wanted to turn Kreuzberg into an upper middle class neighborhood. To deliver its premises, um, the Altbau team identified 12 principles that were meant to serve as nothing less than a constitution written in an activist tone. These principles demanded the democratization of the design and the renewal process, the consideration of current residents, uh, the protection of their uh, rents and financial security, uh, and so on. For instance, among the outbound team, uh, there was the Turkish architect Cihan Arun, who was responsible both for immigrant participation and one of the blocks in Kotbüser Tor. He was educated in Istanbul uh, and he started working for EBA immediately after submitting uh, to the Berlin Technical University his doctoral dissertation about this area. So for EBA, he edited a book, wrote several reports, um, and more consequ consequentially, he had already taken part in the Green Alternatives and the Initiative for Integration with Equal Rights, IGI, civil society groups uh, during the late 1970s and 80s. So this IGI group had exposed the housing discrimination in Berlin in its brochure, What Foreigners Think About Foreign Politics, uh, demanding to be a discussant in the German integration debates, not just the object of discussion. It had reported that landlords and housing bureaus consistently turned down immigrant applications to rent apartments, which subsequently pushed them into the ghettos made up of rundown buildings with small substandard units. And I can certainly confirm this with archival and oral history documents. The apartment will not be rented to foreigners was a very common newspaper advertisement at the time. So taking advantage of immigrants' lack of rights, landlords failed to perform legally, ruined, uh, legally required maintenance, 
since immigrant families could hardly make official complaints about the decaying state of their apartments. So Arun was specifically active in publicly protesting against the Berlin Senate's discriminatory housing regulations, such as the moving ban and the 10% uh, quota that I explained. These restrictions caused the fabrication of fraudulent documents and bribery and were perceived by the immigrants themselves as restrictive measures intended to prevent them from living close to their relatives. Here you see some uh, flyers protesting these um, regulations. So in my interview, Arun summarized, I'm quoting, the social democrats were retaining the moving ban. This was a very authoritarian and racist approach. If the intention was to provide the even distribution of the city land among the population, then they should have passed moving bans on the rich and on the German citizens who received rent subsidies as well. The ban was unconstitutional. So in an area of 310 hectares with 56,000 dwellers, an area composed of many abandoned buildings, uh, some of which uh, had uh, were single room flats, 48% uh, of the units had no private toilets and so on. So in such an area, a participatory uh, urban renewal on a unit by unit basis required the mobilization of many architects, working groups, tenant consultant agencies, and so on. So this team prepared countless handouts to explain the renewal projects, they organized house for Sammlungen for each and every building in order to record and negotiate neighbors' conflicting and compl complementing requirements. Uh, the tenant advisors working in the newly established tenant consulting agencies went door to door to each and every apartment to discuss the residents' needs and budgets. The translators found on streets uh, were employed. Architects removed or added walls, combined or divided units, added stairs to optimize the neighboring tenants' different needs uh, within their budgets. And the developers also agreed to some low-profit deals uh, for the prestige of participating in this project. And the authorities agreed to give social housing status to residents for approximately 25 years so that no single immigrant family was unwillingly displaced from their apartment keeping the original percentage of the immigrants in the area intact. So this percentage was well above the Senate's 10% threshold. In other words, the Senate's discriminatory housing regulations directed at immigrants were subverted uh, in these areas by a group of professionals that was employed by the Senate itself. And realizing that too much renovation would displace the immigrants due to a sudden rent increase, the team modernized buildings by fixing only what the current residents could afford. In Germany, there was a fine distinction between renovation and modernization, and the latter uh, typically caused the rent increase of 11%. So in determining the rent increase, uh, the, the team wanted to categorize many gray areas uh, as renovation rather than modernization in order to protect the tenants, in order not to have them uh, higher rents. For example, some architects convinced the contractors to cut the price of a double window in half by arguing that uh, it was replacing an existing single window anyway. And the big developer fir firms agreed to these profit decreasing demands because they liked the prestige of uh, working in this uh, area. So it would indeed have been very easy for the Berlin Senate to dismiss this team but so many civil society organizations and squatters were mobilized during the process, and so many tenant advisor agencies were established uh, to represent the tenants' interest that uh, the good relations of the team on the ground prevented the Berlin Senate from disregarding their attempts. And the success of this participatory urban renewal without displacement was partially dependent on the activism of the German squatters who had moved illegally into the abandoned buildings and continued to live there without paying rents in order to prevent them from destruction. Most of my interviewees remember that the squatters and non-citizens coexisted in peace, but without much dialogue. Some scholars have also pointed out a blind spot of the squatting movement in Kreuzberg because the squatters failed to recognize their own complicity in maintaining the same racialized structure with the state that they rejected, and because they could not sustain a critique of what it meant to be German. 
So non-citizens from Turkey usually had a low participation rate in squatters' rallies because they were um, because of their Ill, uh, insecure legal status. There were nevertheless a few exceptions, uh, such as the unique situation in Block 145, where the squatters in two buildings included seven refugee families from Turkey who occupied the building in, in November 1980 while they were seeking for political asylum. The incident was recorded in daily newspapers and caused a diplomatic tension when the Turkish ambassador called the refugees to stop squatting. The uh, Turkish-German architect Bahri Dulec from uh, the IBA team supported the self-help renovation of the squatted unit, units in these buildings, uh, through which the refugee occupants gained legal status, their asylum papers came through. So the overall IBA Altbar pro process resulted in the reshuffling of rooms in the existing buildings based on the immigrants' requests, uh, and uh, therefore a very idiosyncratic, unusually large apartments resulted from this process. For instance, here uh, you see two examples of renovation where rooms from the next door building on a higher level are integrated into the units, which is why there are stairs negotiating the level difference inside the living rooms. In addition uh, to the creative renovation of existing buildings, uh, including the squatted ones, Immigrant agency changed the newly built public housing as well. To list some of the most architecturally striking examples, for instance, Yüksel Karachizmeli, an immigrant who lives in Alvarez Siza's building, found the open kitchen inappropriate for Turkish food uh, due to the heavy smells that penetrated into the house. And she made herself a two-part kitchen by using an unclassified space for flexible use, furnishing a space for use is relatively common, but turning it into a kitchen uh, requires significant retrofitting with infrastructural adjustments. Another uh, resident immigrant, uh, Fatma Barış, who now lives in Oswald Matthias Ungers' building, um, turned on uh, this building. For instance, this building uh, represented the architect's obsession with geometric order, uncompromising symmetry, and this obsession resulted in quite excessive ground plans. Fatma Barish turned one such space designed as a second unnecessary entrance bridge into a bedroom. She turned the winter garden into another bedroom. And understandably so, uh, living in a social housing where every inch counts, she prioritized a room of her daughter's own over the symbol of cosmic order that the architect was trying to pass across. Her son painted the walls of his siblings and himself with images appropriate for their ages. Or another immigrant, Hatice Uzun, who lived in three different units of Rab Kriye's uh, building, fixed, built, and painted the spaces. Sakina Albayrak turned the balcony in Zahadis building into, for the handicapped residents into a garden. Yeliz Erçakmak uh, embraced the idiosyncratic and unfamiliar spaces in John Haydock's design as an evolving performative stage, and she embraced herself as a meaning construing participant. Uh, so the examples can be multiplied. Even in the case of the lack of hospitality reflected in architecture, many immigrant habitants triumphed over the closed spaces by making them their own through substantial spatial changes. So against the established history that only credits architects and policymakers, it is possible to demonstrate the importance of immigrant agency in making Kreuzberg what it is today. And let me finish by discussing the situation today. Unlike many cases of urban renewal that causes gentrification, IBA was built as a social housing project, but one through which the Senate tried to employ and partially achieved to employ discriminatory policies between citizens and non-citizens in the city. Due to the public housing status of these buildings, Kreuzberg avoided gentrification until recently, unlike the adjacent neighborhoods such as Mitte and Prenzlauerberg, uh, that became expensive instantly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. During the writing of my book, however, Kreuzberg, especially the Iban Neubau section, began to be gentrified as the public buildings, as the buildings lost their public housing status one after another. During the final couple years of my on-site research and writing, I often found myself returning to buildings where I no longer knew anyone and ringing doorbells of empty apartments waiting for their upgrades. Those of well-known architects were the first to be seized by real estate developers. For instance, in one of the earliest instances, the side block in John Haydock's complex was vacated. 
Ram Colas is building uh, at the now busy uh, and touristic checkpoint Charlie attracted the developers instantly. I witnessed both of these complexes being completely abandoned in a week due to the sudden and drastic rent increases that forced immigrants out of their apartments. The more I saw my former interviewees being evicted, the more I understood that I was catching the final years of the history of a migrant neighborhood. These housing estates are attractive to real estate investors today who are buying the finest examples of public architecture, making a few easy upgrades and wending them back to the residents with overpriced rents. The reason I titled this essay Surplus Value of Public Housing is to draw attention to the vulnerability of qualified public housing at the moment that the public sector leaves the scene to neoliberalism's unchecked and unregulated devices. If one could speak of a value created through architectural design beyond the ordinary standards of public housing, namely, if one could speak of a surplus value that the architects, construction workers, and residents produce together through architectural design, this value ends up in the pocket of the real estate developer during the reign of neoliberalism. It is the capitalists who profits from qualified architecture at the expense of the exploitation of those who created the architectural value, including the architects, tenant advisors, constructing worker, construction workers, and immigrant residents. This new development indicates that the contradictions of the human rights regime hardly disappear with the transformation of refugees into citizenry. The former non-citizens continue to be denied of social citizenship as the exclusion of guest workers and refugees from citizenship in the past is now projected into the present in the form of class difference and white supremacy. So under today's threat of gentrification, many immigrants are acutely aware of these urbanization policies that disenfranchise them. They rightfully take credit for Kreuzberg's urban renewal and its symbolic significance in the global imagination by pointing out their own financial and cultural contributions in making the area one of the most cosmopolitan, creative, and politically engaged places that is now charming to the wealthy and to the real estate developers. During my interview, Suzanne Nishanji for once said, quote, even those associations and agencies that protest against everything stayed silent about the rising rents in Kreuzberg. They must be benefiting from them too. There were many Turks in Kreuzberg, but now they want to throw us out so that rich people can move here. They must think we are not worth this place. We worked and renewed this place. We paid for all this renovation with our rising rents. We fixed many of the crumbling parts ourselves. That means we did the renewal, end of quote. Another resident, Jihan Celik, said, the German state should know this. If Kreuzberg is so beautiful now, it is thanks to the Turkish community. Nobody used to sit outdoors in Berlin. Once we started having cafes and shops on ground floors, everyone followed. Or another immigrant who preferred to be mentioned with the name resident talked about Kreuzberg's gentrification after the 2008 financial crisis and the city's systematic policy to purge Kreuzberg of the foreigners. Observing that many of the finest social housing complexes in Berlin were sold to big corporations with appealing deals, he said, the burden of the economic crisis fall on the public housing and consequently on the immigrant population. So in conclusion, the success of Kreuzberg's urban renewal is now causing the displacement of the ex-refugees and ex-guest workers who actually built it. This story reminds us the importance of theorizing social and global justice together and struggling against exploitation and discrimination, capitalism and racism as intertwined problems. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra, for this great topic. Very rich, very um, interesting in many, many respects. So I'll, I'll put on my... Oh, I, I cannot hear you. I was I was saying that thank you. I want to say thank you for this very okay. rich and interesting uh, paper, which is, as I said earlier on, based on your book, which is which I would highly recommend. I think it's very important. I mean, I guess this is what one of the aspects that make uh, your book so appealing is the, your ability to bring together, you know, oral history, local history, and 
architecture, which is quite unusual as far as I know. Thank you. Um, now uh, we'll have the last talk before the break, which will be given by Marco Pogacnik from the U of University in Venice. Uh, Marco um, is a professor. Uh, he teaches the history of architecture. He's, he has curated a variety of shows, and I would like to name at least Adolf Floss und Wien, uh, which um, was uh, which took place in Vienna about ten years ago. He has published uh, monographic studies on Adolf Floss, but also on Schinke uh, and other architectures. Uh, um, he's written essays about Scarpa, Miss van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, Sitte, and so on. Uh, Marco, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, you were a student of Manfredo Tafuri. Is that correct? It's a correct, yes. <laughs> Manfredo Tafuri, I think, uh, particularly from now on in the conference, it will be a kind of stone guest, you know, the invitato <laughs> di pietra of, of this event. So uh, please, Mark, we have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to hear the uh, uh, earlier two uh, speeches. Uh, my contribution uh, will be not uh, the contribution of a of a militant, uh, or a politician militant. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an historian, but uh, I look uh, with a great uh, sympathy all people that uh, try to improve our cities and uh, the life in our cities. I think it is clear. I will try, try now to, uh, to share my desktop. Huh? Yeah, we, we can see, Mark. You, you can good. see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. So, so it is clear that our seminar deals with a theme uh, that has an evident political uh, significance. The problem of a soaring increase in rents that today afflicts most large cities. Uh, since the 19th century, the share of wages dedicated to renting has described a conflict within urban development itself, the conflict between capital and rent. The quality of social relations and the physical shape of our cities depend on the ability that municipal policies demonstrate in governing this conflict. If the housing problem in the 19th century was caused by the epochal migration of large masses of the rural population to the large cities, today we are in a certainly less dramatic situation as we are witnessing a marked slowdown in population growth and the consequent phenomenon of shrinking cities and urban degrowth. To have an element of comparison between the 19th century urban phenomena and those of today, consider that the population of Vienna between 1840 and 1918 grew from 440,000 to more than 2 million inhabitants, and that Berlin and Vienna now have the same population as they had around 1920. In 1920, Berlin had about 3.8 million inhabitants. Uh, the Berlin and Vienna, however, they are not two shrinking cities. And in recent years, they have shown a very dynamic demographic development with an increase in the level of rents. You see uh, on the top left, uh, the two, uh, the diagram with the growth of population, red, the uh, Berlin situation and blue, the Vienna situation. The Mittendeckel introduced in Berlin 
by the Senate vote on February this year is a law that intends to calm the housing market by capping rents for a period of five years. It is therefore not a strategic instrument for governing urban transformations, but an intervention that configured as transitory and contingent. In Berlin, it was just mentioned before, uh, 340,000 dwellings are affected by this law and homes built uh, built after January 1st, 2014 are excluded from the new legislation. Uh, the calculation of the rent takes place thanks to a middle decal rechner, a calculator available online, which on the basis of fixed parameters, year of construction and some functional uh, uh, other requirements, allow us to obtain the rent per square meter of the accommodation. Can this instrument work? The tool is simple and easy to use and has an expiry date of five years. This could uh, allow the Berlin administration to be able to overcome the current critical phase of the surge of rents by starting to prepare initiatives that could structurally change the supply of housing. Are there any elements of weakness? The Mittendeckel offloads the cost of containing rent to large real estate companies. But one cannot ignore the fact that there is also a share of housing held by small owners for whom housing is a form of investment and who now feel severely damaged. These sacrifices may be required for a limited time. In my opinion, <clears throat> as soon as possible, the discussion on the Mittendecker should make way for a discussion on the urban policies that the municipal of Berlin intends to pursue in the coming decades. At the moment, we have a tool to deal with the contingency, the Mittendecker, but it's not clear what the project is to govern urban growth in the long term. At the moment, the municipality of Berlin is working on the design of new residential districts presented as concrete models for the future city, but uh, these don't seem capable of, of sus substantially affecting the development of the building sector. I'm thinking of the project for Blankenburg Süden, for example, with the construction of 6,000 housing units with schools, kindergarten and commercial spaces. By its construction is planned to be finished only in 2035. In Berlin, however, very interesting initiatives are flourishing in this period, supported by groups of citizens who forming association and cooperatives promote the recovery of individual properties or the construction of new buildings for their housing needs. And my previous colleagues have dealt with this problem comprehensively. I would like to emphasize that these interventions must also have a high architectural and urban quality. It is in this sense that I would like to present uh, um, the EB and B project in the Friedrichstadt in Kreuzberg, a building of high functional complexity with an interesting mix of residences, artist studios and commercial activities. These types of projects are of great urban significance because they demonstrate the presence of a living social structure capable of resisting the re expulsion of residential functions from the most valuable central areas. These initiatives cannot be carried out, however, without the support of the municipality, which must guarantee them access to land at an agreed price. The building designed by the IFAO and Heide und Beckerat offices is located in an area of the highest quality opposite the Berlin Museum and the Jewish Museum of, uh, by Daniel Liebeskind. In front of the museum area, 
the new building creates a square, a new urban center of gravitation. The building has a central corridor illuminated by wells of natural light that transform the circulation spaces into, into places of, of social relation, relations where the inhabitants recognize themselves as part of a small community. The mix of functions, cafe and art studios, favor the way in which this exceptional building relates to the context. Finally, on the roof, we find an almost meditative space, a garden, where the inhabitants of the building can go to drink a beer or read a newspaper. Today, Berlin is experiencing a dynamic situation with a growth of 360,000 inhabitants in the period 2010-2020, which corresponds to about 10% of the total population. This growth in inhabitants has led to a hike in rents of 20% with an impact of a third of the salary. However, these data acquire re their real significance only by taking into account that in Berlin, in Berlin, 85% of the population lives in rented accommodation. This situation has led to the formulation of a radical proposals such as the Deutsche Wohnen project, which envisages the expropriation of all the large real estate companies with assets of a list of at least 3000 homes in the Berlin area. The wide liberalism and privatizations on the recent past want to contrast today with the image of a Rote Berlin a municipality that actively intervenes in the social housing market. However, if we examine the data relating to the construction sector, we realize that such a complex situation must be faced by avoiding ideological shortcuts. The data that emerges from this table, now projected, is very eloquent. In Berlin, the growth of population in the period 2011-2014 uh, was more than double than in Vienna, but Berlin has built less housing than the Austrian capital. It is not surprising that this data does have serious consequences on the dynamics of rents. Do please note that the right-hand Vienna column represents only new dwellings built by cooperatives, whereas Berlin's column represents the total number of new dwellings built in that period. That is to say that Vienna was able to actively intervene in the building market, guaranteeing the balance between population growth and offer of new housing. I will try to clarify the reasons for these differences between Berlin and Vienna during the course of my presentation. The BBU Verband Berlin Brandenburgische Wohnunternehmen is an organization whose members are entrepreneurs working in the field of residential construction in the Berlin Brandenburg area. BBU members own more than 700,000 dwellings, which represent approximately 43% of, uh, uh, of uh, the total rental housing. The following data emerge from a BBU uh, survey. First, in the last year, while awaiting the Mittendeckel, there has been a general slowdown in investments in the residential construction market. Second, in Berlin, we already have the lowest average rents in Germany. And third, in Berlin, the low rents and the high percentage of rental housing are compounded by the fact that apartments have the smallest surface area in the national average, which informs us that in Berlin, the quality of housing should also be a topic to be discussed. In essence, the danger, the danger is that in the next few years, private investments in the field of residence will be diverted mainly to the home in ownership, 
a market segment so far not much loved by Berliners and certainly not very accessible to the weakest social groups. Let's move, let's move on to Vienna. With 1,900,000 inhabitants, Vienna is the second largest city in German-speaking Europe. But this city already boasts what is the largest European real estate company, the Wiener Wohnen, a company that belongs 100% to the municipality of Vienna and which owns 200,000 apartments, 43 of the total, to which 80 180,000 subsidized dwellings must be added. The result of these virtuous practices of the municipality of Vienna can be seen in this slide, which shows that rents in Vienna are not the highest in Austria. The most critical areas are those, are those of Salzburg, due to its proximity to Germany, and of Vorarlberg, due to its proximity to Switzerland. In this slide, you see a parallel with Munich. Of the total rented accommodation in Vienna, 33% is private, 26% municipal, 22% subsidized through cooperatives. This allows Vienna to significantly contain the cost of renting. The income limit for accessing municipal housing in Vienna is 46,000 per year, 87,000 for four member family. The tenants who live in municipality housing, therefore, represent a sector that belongs to a mix of different social classes, from the wealthy lawyer to the municipal employee. In Austria, the share of social housing accounts for 26, 26, 26% of total rental housing. This share in Germany is 4%. Last number, 60% of Viennese live in a house subsidized by with municipal funds, and few of them use the possibility of redemption to become owners of their own dwelling. To maintain such a dominant position in the housing market, the city of Vienna has adopted an extremely flexible policy based on consensus. The Viennese model guarantees the almost socialist building market based on precise <laughs> planning logic, a stability that protects it from any speculative bubble. Even the large private real estate companies accept this model as lower profits are offset by the certainty of the investment. The income rises, the income of these large uh, uh, estate companies rises slowly but steadily. In Vienna, there is no danger of potential phenomena such as those of the speculative bubbles of 208. To 2008. The municipality is guaranteed a high consensus, having completely abandoned any ideological attitude. In re recent years, the municipality has implemented its own regulatory instruments with the so called Bauträger Wettbewerb, introduced in 1995. This is a public selection procedure through a competition that allows the best design teams to be identified on the basis of specific selection criteria, architecture, economy, and ecological concept. The selection procedure is carried out by commissions formed, by, uh, formed of external civil technical bureaus, that means private offices. A jury that combines different skills, among which the themes of urban and architectural quality of the interventions carry great weight. In Europe, there is no city where as much as uh, where as much social residence is built as in Vienna, and there is no city in which the residence can boast a quality comparable to the Viennese one. The Bauträger Wettbewerb system is aimed at identifying suitable sites 
for the development of social housing projects, sites that may or may not be owned by the Wohnfonds Wien. The Wohnfonds Wien is a municipal body whose mission is to coordinate investors, homeowners and the municipal offices that deal with the finance, financing of social housing projects. The Bauträger Wettbewerb is a form of cooperation between private individuals and the Wohnfonds Wien. The procedure forces precise execution times, depending on whether the competition has one or two phases. In the first case, the processing of the competition must be completed in 14 weeks, the work of the selection board in four, in four or five months, as if to say that within nine months you can move from the design phase to the construction phase. To illustrate the functioning of the Bauträger Wettbewerb system and the achievement of the very high quality that this allows in the field of social housing, I present two recent, recent, recent projects by the Artec Architectural Office. Both projects were carried out under the Bauträger Wettbewerb system and provide high quality accommodation at a price of 7.5 euros per square meter. That means 80, 80 square meters represent a rent of 600 uh, uh, euro with the, policy, with the possibility of redemption in uh, uh, 10 years. The first project is the project in Wien in Wiesen Süd in the district uh, Vienna 23. So just a second. Uh, Please make sure you switch off your microphone because we listen to the keyboards, uh, water coming down. So please, I don't know where you are, but please make that, sure. That is not me. No, of course it's not you. Some of uh, some some of the Somebody. some people in the audience still have the the yeah. microphones on. Yeah. And we listen to the it, it's it's Gabu Heindl who should no. switch off. Please. I'm in the train. Uh, please, Hello? please, Gabo, please switch off your, your micro. Okay. I thought it switched off. Sorry. Mm. Okay. Right. There you go. Okay. Can I? I okay. Hope so. <laughs> Sorry, Marco. No, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, uh, this is the first project numbers uh, a thousand dwellings and was built between uh, 20, uh, 2013, 2017 for the client Heimbau. Heimbau is a cooperative founded uh, in uh, 1953, which currently has uh, 9,800 members. The dwellings are relatively small. Toward the park, we find flats of 50 square meters. Instead, toward the street, we find a mix with duplex apartments. The wall complex uh, is raised on piloti, so as to make entry to the park behind it perfectly accessible. On the front, facing the road, there are the collective amenities, cafe, tobacconist, pharmacy, supermarket, so on. The second project, uh, uh, the green design, the, we have the green design is a work of the landscape architects Auberg and Karasch. The modeling of the terrain uh, relates the park to the roof terraces, all accessible and available to the inhabitants as hanging gardens. The second project is located in Berasgasse, Vienna 22 disc, district, uh, and numbers 312 dwellings to uh, um, 29 duplex dwellings and uh, uh, 106 so-called smart Wohnungen for a young sector that does not have many financial resources. The ground floor is destined for commercial use. All apartments are subsidized. Construction is scheduled to begin in uh, 2021, 20, uh, the complex is a, has a remarkable functional mix with housing for the elderly, five commercial units, a mobility point and a co-working area. The project is characterized by five vertical strips 
on which residential towers are arranged, arranged in a very tight sequence, intercepted with circulation areas, service areas, and open areas reserved for private use that generally, generally increase the size of the apartment. The strips uh, are built with a construction system that the architects have adopted from garage bow, avoiding any load bearing partition that limits the flexibility of the plan and with horizontal plates occupied by lodges, balconies, galleries and terraces. The plate and pillar system guarantees maximum flexibility even over time. The size of the dwellings, therefore, is very varied from 50 to 100 square meters. To achieve these objectives, the economic proportion reserved for this item of expenditure in the Austrian state budget is truly considerable. Between 1996 and 2015, for 20 years, the budget reserved for social housing has been constant each year between 2.5 and 3 billion euros. In 2007 alone, this budget was 2.3 billion euros with the construction of 22,000 dwellings. The share reserved for Vienna is approximately 600 million per year. Add to this fact that the municipality has always been foresighted in the acquisition of building areas. The municipality now has reserves of 2.7 million square meters. The high standards that Vienna can boast today in the field of social housing are the result of a development that has its beginning in the great enterprise of the construction of the Ringstrasse in the period 1860-1890. This was followed in 18, 18, 1891 by Otto Wagner's master plan for Greater Vienna and the foundation of a Zentralstelle für Wohnungsreform in Österreich in 1907. Beginning in 1910, part of the municipal building tax, Gebäudesteuer, was allocated to establishment of a, uh, uh, of a welfare housing fund, the capital of which was to be used for social housing. With this system, 8,000 dwellings were built up to 1918. In the years immediately following the end of the First World War, the government of the city of Vienna passed to the Social Democratic Party. Jakob Reumann became the mayor in 1920 and Karl Zeitz three years later. In both councils, the finance minister was Hugo Breitner, an expert in banking systems, a Jew of Hungarian origin. Breitner was defined by his supporters as finance genie, by his detractors as a sadistic tax collector, Steuer sadist. In a troubled period of enormous inflation and complete restructuring of the municipality of Vienna, it must be uh, re regarded that Vienna becomes a municipality detaching itself from itself from Land Niederösterreich at that time, Breitner is a creator of the Wohnbausteuer on the basis of which the first Wiener Wohnbau program foresaw the construction of 25,000 dwellings in five years. The Wohnbausteuer, that means tax for residential construction, was the financial instrument that allowed for the realization of the large projects in the field of social housing of the Rote Wien. The tax was highly progressive. For example, in 1927, the poorest 500,000 housing and commercial premises provided only 23% of the property tax. By contrast, the richest 3,000 uh, homes uh, 0.5% provided 45% of the total tax. The Wohnbausteuer guaranteed the coverage 
of one third of the capital required to fin finance social housing interventions. The innovation established by this tax was that the object of taxation was no longer rents, Mietzinsabgabe, but real estate, Wohnbausteuer, an innovation that allowed tax revenues to be increased by, by gradually burdening the richest taxpayers. In the period 1924-1933, an average of 5,500 houses were built every year, thank thanks to this system, with a peak in 1926 of 9,000 houses. This program allowed an initial improvement in housing conditions, going from 85% occupancy of the building area to 50%, with four apartments distribu distributed to, on, on each landing. This led to a significant reduction in building density, the size of the Rotevin accommodation was very small. 60% of the lodging had a bedroom plus kitchen with a usable area, area of 38 square meters. The greatest innovation in social housing of Rotevin, however, was the quality of the interventions entrusted to a large number of architects for a total of 380 municipal building projects. The assignments ranged from small urban repairs with the construction of empty lots to the construction of large super blocks, which could have more than 1,000 dwellings. It was in that period that the first Mieterschutzgesetze, law for the protection of tenants, was created. Contrary to what is usually stated, the law was not of municipal but federal origin. It was a Bundesgesetz enacted by the federal parliament, then dominated by the Conservative Party, the Christlich Soziale Partei. So the Mieterschutzgesetz is not a social democratic law, but an emergency measure issued in a particularly difficult historical moment. The war, defeat of the empire, the collapse of all the economic and financial structures of the country made it necessary to introduce a law for the protection of tenants. Many of these were families of soldiers who had just returned from the front and lacked any means. Up until the 60s, there was still talk of the Friedensmiete, literally rent of peace. What you see on the screen now is the election manifesto of the Christi Soziale Partei. The message is very clear. The communists have tied the talons of the imperial eagle, preventing it from being able to defend itself while the Jewish snake suffocates its body. Remember that Breitner, the minister of finance of the municipality of Vienna, was Jewish. Before the First World War, rent represented 25% of wages. After the introduction of the meter shoots in 1922, rent accounted for 2% and had the function of keeping wages low in order to support national industry in international economic competition. Ultimately, the the purpose of this law was to transfer wealth from rent to industrial capital. The effect of this law was the rapid physical deterioration of unmaintained homes, the loss of value of buildings and the collapse of land values. Uh, these consequences would have been devastating for the housing market if the municipality of Vienna had not accompanied the Mieterschutzgesetz with two other laws of municipal, municip of municipal origin, the Wohnbausteuer and the Wohnungsförderungsgesetz, which I taught, uh, talked about earlier. These three laws form the basis for all subsequent municipal policies in the field of social housing. 
All these measures allowed the municipality of Vienna, which already owned 70% of the land, to see its assets doubled in 1931, a prerequisite for the success of the subsequent social housing policy. I repeat, the rent law presupposes intense building activity in Vienna in the 1970s. Could be different today. Could Berlin introduce a meeting decal without simultaneously interve intervening massively in the real estate and land market as well as in tax leverage? In 1926, an important international convention was held in Vienna, the International Housing and Town Planning Congress. Also participating in this was Martin Wagner, who at the time held the position of director of GEHAG, the construction cooperative of the trade unions with which he built in 1926 the Hufeisensiedlung to together with Bruno Taut. Wagner praises the municipality of Vienna for its social policy, but raises some sharp criticism of the Viennese model. First, the presence given to the multi-story rental house, the so-called meat house, to the detriment of the detached or terrace house. Second, the rent corresponding to 2% of the salary. This contradicts, according to Wagner, any economic role that requires the cost of producing the goods to be included in the price. Third, low rents justified with the aim of keeping wages low and in this way making national industry competitive. And last point, the idea that meat house is economically more advantageous than low density buildings. Marty Wagner's position is clear. The real battle is not to lower rents, but to raise workers' wages in order to force both industry and the building sector to a profound rationalization of work and production. The economic model of the communist Martin Wagner is America, and his myth is Fordism. Wagner intervenes in the Congress with a second speech in the fifth session, once again making very interesting observations, noting another important difference between the housing policy in Berlin and the Viennese one. Vienna had decided that the municipality should be the main responsible for social housing, while on the contrary, Wagner suggests that the municipality should only play the role of distributor of capital by entrusting the real building activity to the people, to the what he called Gemeinnützige Gesellschaften, Genossenschaften und Organe alle Art, the chari chari charitable companies, the cooperatives and, and bodies of all, of all kinds. Wagner's conclusion is that Die Wohnungspolitik soll in einem gewissen Sinne entpolitisiert werden. The residential policy must be depoliticized by promoting the free initiative of individuals and cooperatives. Before going to search for such distant models as the Vienna of the 20s, I think that Berlin first has an obligation to study its own tradition in the field of urban planning because it is a story of the highest prestige. Martin Wagner's position was discussed in depth by Manfredo Tafuri, uh, that was first mentioned by Jacopo, in his book on Red Vienna, a work to which a certain authority is still attached today, despite some gaps that subsequent literature was highlighted. It is true that Tafuri stigmatizes the parasitic nature of a capital that does not want to organize itself as a city of work. 
but this uh, does not mean that the Rotevin experiment was not, according to him, an exceptional urban experience. Tafuri's last chapter on Rotevin is represented by an essay that appears four years later in the catalog of an IBA Berlin exhibition, Das Abenteuer der Ideen. Tafuri's essay is entitled Realismus und Architektur zur Konstruktion volksbezogener Sprachen. Realism and Architecture on the Construction of Languages Aimed at the People. Uh, uh, sorry. Don't worry, Marco. Uh, maybe can you can you bring your talk to a close in in five ten in, minutes? In five minutes, I am okay. I I will I conclude. My, don't worry, my don't worry. That, then we have a break and and, and yes, maybe we can yes, sorry. ask some questions. So, sorry. After Tafur, the break. Tafur, Tafur is interest in the poetics of realism in architecture derives derives from the high ethical value, a value, a value that is expressed in the desire to communicate, the will, the will to build narratives aimed at a large audience. Realism presupposes the existence of a collective subject, uses popular tradition and is rooted in avant-garde, in, as in rooted in archetypal models. But there is another fundamental point. Realism is deeply anti-avant-garde. Tafuri detested the avant-garde, hated the creators of new languages. Tafuri distances himself from any nihilism, from any ideology of permanent innovation, from any desire to provoke the public. What is the narrative form of realism? This form is the epic, and this language manifests itself as an excess that is explained only by the urgent need for communication. Uh, historical experiences such as Russian realism, Italian neorealism uh, of the 50s and the Rotevin of the 20s respond to this ethical imperative uh, um, um, studied by uh, Tafuri. I conclude my communication with a last thought. History is not at our disposal to legitimize, legitimize contingent politics on the basis of a historical event from the past. Therefore, always relevant is the invitation of a great German historian, Hans Ulrich Wehler, who in 1988 wrote a book entitled Aus Geschichte Lernen, Do We Learn from History? Wehler's answer to this question is contained in this passage, which I quote in full. History cannot offer solutions to current problems, but it has other advantages. In the first place, it makes the historian competent in his own subject by preventing him from falling into terrible simplifications, utopian passions and unacceptable dogmatism. Confidence with historical problems nurtures a healthy skepticism against any promise of quick recovery and the quick solution of the world's great riddles. Confidence with historical matters give us a certain flair for the harshness of conflicts, for the selfishness of interest, for the resistance of institution, for the recalcitrant nature of reality that always escapes its totalizing understanding. Vienna and Berlin, the, the last uh, sentence, Vienna and Berlin are the two cities that for 300 years since 1701 have written the history of the German speaking peoples in the form of a Deutscher dualismus. Prussia versus Holy Roman Empire, Protestant Hohenzollerns versus Catholic Habsburgs, 
in, his, in the history of urban planning, the Hofe, Hofe against the Siedlung. Perhaps today that, that Deutsche dualismus no longer has a reason to exist. And it is right for Berlin to look to Vienna, but certainly not to become the Rote Wien of the new millennium. This is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It was very interesting. And thank you for bringing together the, the two main poles of, of our conversation today. Uh, I think we are fairly tired. I would suggest that we reconvene in 15 minutes. But before we do that, I would like to ask if she can hear us, um, Gabu Heinrich, if she would be ready to speak in 15 minutes. Because Hi, Jeff Kupo. Yeah, Hi, I can hear you. I was uh, listening yeah. all the time, as you heard also. I'm very sorry about uh, the moment that I was in the train. Uh, I'm still moving back. Um, so if it's in, I, I will see. I'd rather prefer actually to just basically get installed and do the second uh, lecture, if sure. it's okay. Okay. Valentina yeah. Orioli, can, can we switch? And can you talk before Gabo Ander uh, in, in 15 minutes? Uh, yes, of course, I can. That, that'd be great. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, so let's let's reconvene uh, uh, in 15 minutes, to, so 4.35. Um, and yeah, and we'll, maybe we can begin with the question first, and then we can have two more talks. Otherwise, it's, we might forget what has been said like two hours ago. Okay, uh, so I'll see you in 15 minutes. Okay. Your micros and, and cameras. But don't leave. Ha sbagliato a cliccare la manina, sì, capita. Ok, uh, let's uh, begin again our seminar. I thank you all of you for attending this part. Uh, also, we have decided in the break to uh, postpone the general discussion of the questions to the first three uh, talks, uh, uh, postpone all of this to the uh, two final uh, interventions by Valentina Orioli and Gabo Heindel. So we'll begin again with them. Uh, our seminar, you know, the general title of the seminar is Red Berlin, Red Vienna, but uh, it's focused on rent policies, migration and social housing. Uh, in general, we uh, underlie uh, uh, this general uh, subject, as we have seen, not only epistemological problems like uh, uh, Jacopo emphasized the, introducing the, uh, the our afternoon uh, of discussion, but also some theoretical questions about, for instance, and this appeared very clearly in the last uh, or, or more than the last the last two uh, um, talks, uh, theoretical problems like relationship between a uh, kind of uh, design of places, social outcome and forms of life uh, included in this design. So uh, a more general theme about form and function. But uh, Jacopo, we, I think we can start again. Please I leave you to introduce our next uh, speakers. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, our next speaker um, is Valentina Rioli, who is Associate Professor of Urban Planning at the Department of Architecture, but she's also Deputy Mayor for uh, Urban Planning, Real Estate, Environment, Preservation and Renewal of the Historic Center and nomination of Ipotesi di Bologna to the UNESCO at the Municipality of Bologna. So both an academic and a high-profile politician, to put it briefly. Valentina, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Jacopo, and good afternoon, everybody. I am very uh, honored to be here with you this, after this afternoon because um, your seminar is very interesting to me and it pushes me to have um, a critical attitude uh, uh, 
towards some uh, problems that I face every day as a high profile, I don't know, but as a, a public administrator. Uh, I try to um, share my, my screen so that I switch off the camera. Okay. I think you can see me. Sì, sì, tutto a posto. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, this presentation is quite different, I think, from the other, uh, um, the other that you have seen, because I will try to switch from politics to policies, and uh, I will try to explain, to show you in a few minutes, what is the uh, current approach of the city of Bologna to housing. And what are, for instance, our uh, our problems? What is the housing issue today in Bologna? Um, first, uh, I want to outline uh, some considerations about the European experience. When we when we work in Bologna together, my colleagues uh, in the municip municipality, we always start from Europe. <laughs> we always look at. Uh, uh, Europe as a, a reference and also we look at other cities in Italy. For instance, we always ask uh, what are they doing in Milan? What are they doing in Florence or in Turin? These are our references and then we, we look at Europe. Uh, Europe is very important uh, and we, we can see that uh, if we speak about uh, social housing in Europe, we can see that uh, there are uh, countries with very different uh, conditions. For example, Austria is uh, a country where uh, social house is very developed. Uh, it is 24% uh, of the total uh, stock of housing. Uh, Italy is uh, one of the countries where uh, the offer of social housing is less developed. It represents only the three or four percent of the whole stock of housing of houses in the in the whole uh, country. And um, uh, we have to know that the competencies for housing policies has been transferred from the state to the regions, and from the regions they are uh, daily transferred to local authorities. Uh, so that uh, the sector is led by municipalities and by the local housing agencies with uh, a very lack of support by the central government. This is the first problem. Lack of support means, uh, of course, also lack of uh, financial uh, investment. In 2008, a uh, national housing plan, the so-called Piano Casa, uh, recognize a substantial role of a private capital in contributing to increase affordable housing supply. So uh, it provided a definition of social housing uh, that is intended as a, ha as a, as a system of um, a housing offer um, that has the aim of uh, offering an affordable house to uh, middle class people, but it is supported but, uh, the, by the private, uh, not uh, but, uh, by the public, um, how it was in the past. Uh, always speaking about Europe, uh, in U Europe is a, is a, a continent of uh, people who, who lives uh, um, um, in, in the most part of the cases in a, in a, in a property house, in their own house, for the 70 percent. Uh, of course, this is a, 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 a um, a, middle, uh, a middle data, there are countries where the, the tax of property houses is uh, highest and other where it is lower. Um, and uh, it is uh, a continent where a lot of people uh, has a problem with their own house uh, because they spend 40% uh, or more or, or their uh, disposable income on housing. Uh, this data is, uh, is very critical uh, and uh, it is uh, more and more critical if you consider that uh, um, tenants with rents spend uh, at least 25% of the their income at market price, um, uh, uh, of their income for uh, accessing to, to the house. So the problem is uh, basically with, uh, not with the owners, but basically with people that uh, have uh, a, a rented house. And the problem is 
one of the reasons of the, the fragility of, uh, of, uh, of these uh, uh, people. This fragility, this economic fragility, is accentuated, of course, by the pandemic. Uh, because a lot of people with, with, who have uh, rents uh, uh, also lost their work, uh, and uh, this has, has shown us uh, the importance to go back uh, to housing policies, to public policies, uh, and also to consider uh, the uh, importance of houses, uh, not only in these uh, terms, but also the importance of houses as places for life. So um, the pandemic suggests, uh, strongly suggests uh, to us uh, to consider uh, the uh, public intervention uh, on the sector of, uh, of housing, uh, the public support for people who have problems with their rents, but also uh, a more uh, broad policy that considers uh, the quality uh, of housing of housing, the quality of the offer in a, in a, in a broad sense. Bologna. Uh, in this context, uh, Bologna is uh, um, a city which has this, uh, these facts, these numbers. You can see uh, that we have uh, more or less uh, 400,000 inhabitants. But uh, besides these inhabitants, we have at least 100,000 city users each day. Uh, Bologna is a, a crossroad city and it is characterized by movement of the people and by uh, a demographic dynamic that is quite important to us. Um, it is the strength of the city. So uh, one of the, um, of the um, objectives of uh, the public administration is to maintain this dynamic. Of course, I'm not speaking about the pandemic, but uh, I'm speaking of uh, 2019. Uh, so we have to maintain this dynamic that has uh, two different characteristics. From one side, uh, the city is an attractive city. Uh, we have um, uh, constant immigration uh, of young people, of young families, of people looking for a good job. Uh, this kind of uh, immigration is uh, sustained by the presence of the university and of high quality services. But on the other side, we have a city where uh, um, population is uh, old, where we have also a lot of immigration of people uh, uh, from um, other countries uh, who can have uh, problems with their uh, uh, social inclusion, with their work. Uh, uh, they have uh, usually big families, and so they need uh, more uh, uh, assistance and more services. And uh, we have uh, to face uh, uh, conditions of uh, fragility, both uh, from the social and from uh, economic point of view. Uh, so the, the, the main uh, target is to sustain this, uh, uh, the good part of this dynamic and also to face uh, the problem, to face fragility. And uh, of course, we know that this kind of fragility is increased by the pandemic. Uh, I, I insist on this idea of, uh, of dynamic because I think that uh, we, we have the... Um, we, we can't freeze the city. We can't fix it uh, in 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 a in a strong way. Uh, we must uh, balance the different uh, trends uh, and the different flows of people that cross uh, uh, the space of the city. Uh, this condition is not so usual in Italy. You have to consider that. Uh, um, the, the most lively Italian cities, also from the economic point of view, are Milan and then Bologna. Uh, so uh, we are committed in maintaining this uh, uh, this uh, trends because <laughs> we, we 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 fear to to join the other Italian cities that uh, have uh, many problems with uh, uh, social economic trends. Housing market in Bologna. Uh, in Bologna there are um, 
225,000 houses. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the greatest part uh, of the houses is uh, inhabited by their own owners. But you can see that the number of owners is lower than uh, the, um, the national uh, the national one that is uh, over 70%. So we have also a lot of renters, 30% of renters. And um, we know that renters occupy more than uh, 52,000 houses and 12,000 uh, of, uh, of them are public. So we have a good uh, social housing stock. It is almost 6% of the entire stock. It is uh, double if compared with the, the national trend. In addition to uh, the um, 12,000 public houses, uh, we have 40,000 houses that are rented at, uh, at uh, market price, as, as I said, but uh, in this 40,000, we have a lot, uh, almost uh, 50%, that uh, are rented uh, with the canone concordato, that is a, a formula of uh, uh, agreement uh, um, that is uh, very, very diffused in Bologna. I can say that uh, this uh, particular diffusion of the canone concordato could be related also to the ability of the municipality to uh, negotiate, <laughs> to be the, uh, the, um, the intermediary subject uh, uh, between uh, um, uh, the people who want to rent a house and the association of the owners. This is an historical character of the city that uh, is uh, the, the, known as the city of cooperation. And this attitude to cooperate is also uh, an attitude to negotiate and to uh, make tables and discuss and try to find out solutions for um, also this kind of, um, of problems. Uh, I told you that we have a lot of city users. Uh, these city users are basically students, but also tourists, because in the recent years, uh, Bologna became a tourist city. And it wasn't in the past. Uh, they are daily commuters, like me, for example, but also users of the services of the city. I think about earth services, for example. Uh, these city users all want to stay in the city center, basically, and uh, the city center, uh, which has uh, 50,000 inhabitants, uh, residents, they, uh, they are stable, they don't change. Uh, the city center is uh, a, a place of competition among uh, the other inhabitants that occupy the homes that are not occupied by the residents, of course. So uh, it is a field of competition among uh, students, tourists, and other city users. And here, the fight for the house is quite, uh, quite uh, strong. The students are a very important uh, category of uh, inhabitants of the, cities, uh, of the city. For us, they are citizens, uh, even if they don't uh, vote and they, are don't, uh, and they are not residents in Bologna. Um, the University of Bologna has got uh, more or less uh, 65,000 students in town, uh, of which uh, 32,000 looking for an accommodation. Uh, 32,000 are students from other regions of Italy, other cities, or Erasmus students. And you have to notice that uh, face this number only 1.6 thousand beds uh, are uh, available at uh, a lower cost. So uh, this is a very big problem. Uh, in recent years, uh, um, Bologna has been chosen by many student housing operators, which are developing specific offer for students. So uh, the students, they live in, uh, in flat, in the homes of the city, of course, but they are um, starting to experiment also different solutions. 
uh, generally of huge dimension, uh, 400 or 500 beds each one, uh, that offer different kind of services. Uh, so the, the level of, uh, of services is highest, but of course also the, 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 pri the price is highest. Uh, student housing is uh, is changing, and uh, we we can uh, observe that uh, the the demand for student for student housing is very fragmented. The students tend to choose uh, uh, different uh, different solutions. Uh, anyway, the number of places for students at the right price is very very low. It is too low, and this is a big problem to us. Uh, in these days, uh, during pandemic, uh, the municipality has launched uh, a call for private owners um, to switch back from uh, B and B to students' accommodation. So we, we finance private owners that uh, set to uh, change their offer and uh, to switch back to students. We try to improve the offer students also with this mean, but of course it is a temporary mean. I told you also that Bologna is a city of cooperation. Uh, of course, cooperation in housing is very important in the city, so we have uh, uh, cooperative property housing, but in recent years we tried to improve also forms of collaborative housing. Uh, we improved the public co-housing and also a regulation for private co-housing. Um, a regulation in urban plan basically means that uh, the municipality recognizes the public interest of co-housing in itself, of course. Uh, I titled this uh, presentation A Thousand House for Bologna um, because this is the title of an agreement signed by the municipality and the public uh, house agency uh, with the aim of uh, uh, individuating a wide range of housing solutions uh, through a strong economic and management effort. Uh, this protocol um, reflects the municipality of the house demand in the city it focuses on urban regeneration, so it focuses on the renewal of the stock, basically. Uh, it goes back to public direct intervention in social housing. You have to say that in 2016, we had uh, big projects involving uh, an idea of uh, social housing that comes from the Piano Casa with uh, public funds, uh, um, financement for a, a middle class social housing but then we decided to uh, switch back <laughs> to uh, to use our own um, our own properties to develop uh, a direct public intervention uh, and to develop uh, dwellings uh, as uh, real public houses. So now we are uh, arriving at the construction of new uh, 150 dwellings uh, in, uh, in uh, Navile district, very close to the railway station. That is also mean to avoid the gentrification of this district that is uh, um, very appreciated from people and uh, is attracting uh, uh, middle and upper class uh, uh, people uh, and also um, offices and uh, new activities. And uh, in this protocol, we also allow many small punctual interventions, as if uh, housing was a middle for practicing a sort of uh, urban uh, acupuncture. But uh, in these days, and this is the reason why I'm so tired and <laughs> I have a difficulty with my English today, in these days we are also adopting the new urban general plan that is called the PUG. Uh, it is a plan that uh, recognizes Bologna as a small European metropolis. This is a, a general vision of the city, uh, characterized by the richness of differences and by a shape designed for people. 
uh, based on these characteristics, the city states that it wants to become uh, increasingly sustainable and inclusive, capable of attracting businesses, jobs, and uh, also young people and families. So the, the uh, target is always maintaining our attractiveness and being more and more sustainable. Uh, here you see the general um, description of the city that is at the basis of this new plan. You can find the plan at this address and read it if you want. Uh, this plan has uh, three main objectives, uh, so we state resilience, uh, uh, habitability and attractiveness, and 12 urban strategies that comes from these main objectives. Um, the 12 urban strategies define 24 local strategies and about 60 actions that are described in this uh, table that you are seeing now. Uh, if we, if you, if you read this uh, this table, you will see that habitability is uh, considered a general strategy for the whole plan. Uh, so it is uh, very important for the vision of the future of the city. Uh, you see um, here um, a focus on the 12 urban strategies of the plan. I, I apologize, I, I haven't translated it uh, in English because, uh, you know, we are adopting now, so I don't have uh, English materials about this plan yet. Uh, but uh, uh, the idea for us is that the housing issue uh, must be approached in a broader perspective. So we consider habitability and attractiveness of the city as a whole, not only housing as a specific theme, but a theme inside a, a broader vision that uh, comprehends also the, an attention for uh, the network of services, uh, for the redesign of public spaces, uh, for uh, uh, the sustain to uh, economic activities uh, and uh, the redesign of uh, infrastructures. Uh, our strategy for uh, extending access to the house uh, um, is based on five actions. Here I translated it into English so that you can see. Um, and you can see that this uh, five action resume uh, some of the things that I told you before, uh, such as introduce functional and typological mixes, uh, involve communities through participatory processes, experiment, experiment in new forms of housing. But uh, most of all, uh, the first two actions are very important to us. Promote the increase and innovation of rented housing offer and encourage the increase in social housing supply. Why I stress this? Because I told you at the beginning that rent, rent is the problem. People who uh, occupy uh, rented uh, houses has uh, many problems from the economic point of view and they have many difficult to change their house or to find out a new house. Uh, and we have at the same time the uh, need to encourage the increase of the offer of social housing. For this reason, in this plan, we took the general definition of social housing provided by the Piano Casa of 2008, that is very generic, and we uh, try to specify what is social housing for the municipality of Bologna today. We defined uh, edilizia residenziale sociale, uh, social housing, as uh, um, uh, interventions of general interest, so as services, functional to increase and differentiate the offer of, of housing services for rent. So we established that social housing is only houses for rent. This is a very, very strong and we have uh, many, many problems with uh, private developers in this uh, period because they, um, of course, don't agree with our uh, position, but we are trying to take position because we want to um, try to correct uh, um, attitudes uh, of the of the market and of the people who uh, participate in uh, housing market in the city. Uh, 
of course, this idea of social housing as uh, uh, housing services for rent uh, involve uh, not uh, only permanent housing, but also uh, student housing. We defined our housing need in uh, 6,000 in the next uh, 10 years, 6,000 dwellings uh, for rent. And uh, each uh, intervention in the city will have 20% of uh, social housing intended in this sense. So we tend to private to develop housing for rent. Um, this is uh, our point uh, at this time. Some consideration about it. Uh, the first is uh, the recent rediscovery of housing policies, the necessity of uh, trying to lead public policies on housing. Uh, this is uh, very important and the pandemic uh, shows us uh, more and more that uh, it is a crucial point uh, of public policies. Uh, in Italy, uh, we have to state that a financial investment is necessary. Uh, some years ago, I wrote together with Angela Bar Barbanente, that was the deputy for planning at the Regione Puglia, uh, an essay where we stated that uh, the abolition of the taxes uh, on, uh, on the property houses in Italy as uh, as um, uh, has cancelled the possibility to have uh, a fund to <laughs> give uh, houses to poor people. So uh, in this moment, we don't have uh, a strong uh, financial system for uh, improving uh, uh, real public housing, but this is necessary. Uh, rent. Rent is a specific problem that uh, involves not only students, not only temporary inhabitants, but if we consider the necessity to support the attractiveness of the city, rent is also a, a specific part of the attractiveness for new inhabitants. But it, mu it must be seen in a broad perspective, together with the offer of services and with the offer work, of course. Municipalism. You speak about municipalism and I agree that uh, the protagonism of cities is very important. I want also to underline that uh, in Italy uh, often the protagonism of city is a necessity because there's a lack uh, of policies uh, at the government level. And so uh, if, you, if you don't uh, practice municipalism, you, you risk to disappear. Uh, this is, uh, anyway, uh, very. Uh, it is also a, a character in the history of Bologna, uh, and it is well connected to the idea of constantly looking at Europe and exchanging experiences with other cities. Uh, and also, it is connected with the, the history of the city, a, an history where uh, planning is uh, a constant attitude. Uh, and where also cooperation and participation are, uh, are very, very important. Uh, I, I, uh, not, I wrote uh, social infrastructure first while uh, Matty Matti Clausen was speaking. Uh, is right. Uh, this is a matter of public. And uh, so uh, we, we have to... Um, persuade also the government that uh, um, social housing uh, and uh, social infrastructure uh, only devolved to uh, private initiative. Uh, and then the, the last observation is that uh, um, a city in this period, in this uh, special period, uh, must face uh, uh, temporary measures. I, I told you about our temporary measure to uh, switch back from Airbnb to student housing. We, we, we have also other uh, temporary measures uh, for uh, sustaining people during pandemic, for example. Um, these are all important measures, but they don't substitute long-term policies and they can't also be um, uh, a problem for uh, 
enhancing long-term policies. So uh, a public administration must uh, keep uh, um, in attention the two dimensions and try to work for balance uh, the one and the other. And so I think uh, uh, one of the very difficult point uh, of our work because we always have to um, try to stay in equilibrium <laughs> between uh, two uh, different orders of uh, uh, problems and uh, of necessity, of course. I thank you. I hope uh, you, you understood the uh, general sense of this uh, intervention. And the way thank you, Valentina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, although we are online, I think it's always very important to kind of touch bases and okay. see what's going on in Bologna. Uh, and I think we we can now have Gabu Heinde. Hope hopefully she's still with us. Gabu. Hello. Hiya. Ah, so let me introduce you to our, our audience. Gabu is an architect. Uh, but she also teaches at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London. Uh, and she's also a, an, an author. She's recently published a book, which is uh, called uh, Stadtkonflikte, <clears throat> which is in German, as you, as you might guess. Uh, hopefully there'll be a translation in the coming years. It's, it's a very interesting book that tries to reclaim, I would say, Gabo, the, the legacy of Red Vienna. Um, but which also engages with, with Tafuri's critique. So hopefully there will be kind of, um, um, you know, space to, 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 to engage in conversation with what Marco suggested, and of course the other speakers as well. Uh, Gabu, can you um, um, activate your camera? Uh, my camera is activated. Do you not see me? You mean uh, the Yes, now we can see you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Do you have a PowerPoint? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So uh, I'll give you over to you. Uh, as you know, uh, you you've been with us, so you know that by now. I would I would suggest that you you show us your PowerPoint, and then when you talk, you just show yourself. I need to share my screen, and I need to find that. Um, it's a bit slow. How do you do that here? I've been on Teams. Uh, and now I, I don't think. know, but uh, you have to open the PowerPoint and then include it, uh, switching the the arrow I on the right on your right. Up upper part of the screen. Yeah. There is small arrow. You cl you click there, and it it. You you can choose among the files you have opened. Mm -hmm. Up and right click on the small arrow. It will open. Uh, you are allowed to do that. I did it before. So oh, um trying to find that because actually I, I have you found the arrow next to leave right yeah uh, next to the red leave button i have the red leave button in the bottom but um, yeah okay. <laughs> no no <laughs> no really in the bottom. Easier. up in the top yeah but th there's a there's a kind of yeah there's an arrow that goes into a box basically actually, i'm so sorry um a little bit pornographic uh, icon. Okay, why don't anybody show me just quickly? I'm like, I'm maybe. Uh, like, how? Actually, how do we show you? How do you do that exactly? Um, um, you, you, I, I mean, in my screen, it's next to my microphone, the, the button that indicates the microphone. But Camera, I, microphone, and yeah. enter the PowerPoint. But it, I, I know exactly how it looks like, it just won't let me do it. Um, Maybe, maybe, Andrea, are you sure that you authorize? Uh... No, no, I have authorized her. Okay. I have already checked it. She's authorized try, as. I will try to come back in for a moment. Yeah. Okay. Just let me come in again. Sorry.
But if you don't realize it, you can send to me or to Jacopo your your PowerPoint. She sure. left. She should be back now, hopefully. She left, she left. <laughs> Is she back or not? I don't know. I'm yes, she's back. back. Yeah. Okay. I just need to find it again. Um, so, where is the share screen button? Okay. Um, Put the arrow in the box. I'm going to change it there, so maybe that works. Anyway, you can send your PowerPoint to Jacopo uh, and yeah. he will help you. Jacopo, I have a question. Uh, if you give me five minutes, yeah, I will transfer to another, uh, uh, maybe it's my computer and the, micro, the Microsoft Teams. Um, okay, so maybe we can begin with some questions. So yeah. That yeah. We can I'll come back in with another with another document. Okay, I think it's much better because I I, I can't. Of course, I can share your your PowerPoint, but it's quite difficult to coordinate that. I'm really sorry. I think it's my it's it's there's something I I had problems today before. Okay, so I'm yeah, just, just, just that I'm just okay. Trying. Keep us posted. Uh, okay, so I will I will begin with with a couple of questions before Gabo can uh, rejoin us. Um. Maybe I can begin with my questions and then so that, you know, uh, we'll make it, it quicker. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Matty and Ezra to, to react to Michael's very rich presentation. Uh, and I think one of the main points was uh, a rent cap is not enough. We need building activity. Uh, and of course, uh, raising the workers' wage, and I wondered what uh, you know what Matthew would would say about that. Matthew, yes, um, uh, yeah, it's a good question because uh, here at Coti in our demonstrations, uh, we uh, we had this uh, claim up with the uh, wages, down with the rents. And uh, we also, there's also a mural here where this is like the central piece. Um, and I absolutely agree. And of course, I also absolutely agree with the rent cap not being enough. I mean, we have this, uh, uh, we have this, this poster, rent cap, good for five years, uh, socialization, good for your whole life. Um, and, uh, and so, so, but also apart from, from this uh, shorter time frame, uh, I think the, the, the integration of this rent question with uh, also with construction, of course, because we lack uh, tens of thousands of affordable flats. Not any flat is uh, uh, contributing to a solution, but um, it has to be affordable, of course. Uh, but also all the other activities. And I was, I think for me, it was very interesting to hear this uh, super low, if I understood correctly, 2% of the income for, for, for the flat, that sounded almost too good to be true. But in general, the idea to keep the rent low, to uh, accommodate the interest of productive capital, to keep the wages low, because if the workers don't have to pay so much, you can give them less money. Uh, I mean, this was a, a strong idea in the, uh, a few decades ago. And now we have this new faction of capital that is not so much interested how much a worker earns, uh, because this is not uh, this is not a cost in his calculation. In his calculation, the cost is the income through uh, through the rent. So uh, I think this is really interesting how this shift uh, is uh, between between the more um, like you could say productive uh, uh, capital and and the one that uh, is extracting money out of houses. How this shift is affecting the rent. 
Uh, I thought this is very interesting. We um, we published a brochure called uh, Socialization and uh, Gemeinwirtschaft. Hmm. Let's say commons, maybe more or less, uh, where we um, um, sketch a, a broader plan. What uh, what this uh, what what public housing can uh, can achieve, and not only uh, good uh, labor relations good working conditions in the company, but also, for example, this whole uh, construction sector. There is the, the idea of a Berliner Bauhütte, uh, like a, a state-owned construction uh, company that works for this public sector companies and, um, and is, like all the rest, of course, uh, uh, the idea is to, to have this kind of uh, democracy in economy. Um, and, uh, and also uh, the question of sustainability uh, um, that is obviously now integrated into this plan in Bologna. I mean, we have this uh, climate crisis and catastrophe not coming, but happening. And um, if you have control over, uh, over housing, and housing is a super important sector in, in, in regard to, to climate change, uh, you can uh, easier uh, and, and, and much more affordable uh, implement uh, measures to reduce uh, emissions and uh, to build more ecologically but also to maintain the houses more ecologically so i absolutely agree that capping rents is not at all um, sufficient to solve the housing crisis but to solve all the other problems that we are facing at the moment this crazy pandemic that's going on with this redistribution of wealth uh, the, the climate uh, catastrophe and so on. There's uh, so many challenges at the moment and um, that demand for a more integrated answer than just to cap the rents. But I want to say to cap the rents is a good start. <laughs> it's a lot of work and I, I hope uh, more cities are implementing this measure. Um, yeah, but uh, of course, I'm absolutely, I absolutely agree that this cannot be enough. Yeah. Maybe I can also um, say sure, something, um, since you um, asked the question to me as well. Um, I mean, of course, capping the rents uh, will not be enough, uh, but we should also uh, not let this conclusion trivialize uh, what's being done with uh, putting a rent cap, uh, because, um, you know, the conclusion that we, sh you know, capping the rents will not be enough, it's important to raise the wages. In a way, it's the same conclusion, uh, or it's in the same line with the conclusion of Tapuri, uh, that you cannot really fix the housing problem unless you fix capitalism, unless you, um, you know, you um, destroy, demolish capitalism, which is true, of course, uh, but um, that conclusion may also paralyze uh, the architectural field as it has paralyzed um, the architects and the architectural students for um, the last decades with the debates about post-criticality and uh, so on and so forth, uh, that many generation of architects somewhat uh, got disinvested in public housing or in uh, building or, or designing for public good and uh, ended up in this very defeatist um, and somewhat sometimes opportunist for some, it was defeatist, for others it was opportunistic that, you know, the only thing that architects can do is just to wait for clients. They cannot really uh, demolish capitalism, abolish capitalism. So what, what what's the point of trying to um, put a rent cap or trying to do affordable housing and so on and so forth. So I think um, we um, also need to understand that these uh, different struggles um, can are not exclusive are not uh, mutually exclusive uh, and we also I think uh, need to think of the word failure I mean I uh, I heard several times that red Vienna was a failure uh, yes uh, Martin Wagner and Burnatas Gihad was a failure because they did not sustain themselves as public as or they could not really um, you know, unless uh, you couldn't raise the wages, it was not um, that sustainable to keep the rents low, or it was impossible to keep the rents low. But uh, when we call this a failure, I think we are also trivializing uh, the struggle. Maybe we should admit that um, success needs to be unavoidably temporary uh, in our age. Um, and in order not to trivialize um, the niches of struggle, um, 
we have to maybe redefine our um, understanding of success as temporary and understand that the struggle for the big picture and the struggle for the niches in the big picture are not mutually exclusive. Uh, and brand cap is still a huge work, amount of work, and it's, it's a very important struggle. So I wouldn't want to trivialize what's going on with the rent cap struggle by just saying that it is, it won't be enough. Yes, it won't be enough, but you know, we still have to um, have uh, parallel struggles. Um, so Ezra, not, thank not you. That, 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 that's, that's an absolute, that's absolutely right. To redefine what success means is something you probably need to um, extend to other fields as well. Mark, do you want to say something? <laughs> so uh, the uh, discussion is very difficult because uh, uh, there are these are really broader field and the, we need an, an economic knowledge to discuss about uh, that uh, uh, I did I don't have. But I think uh, a clock is ticking now. It's ticking. And in five years, we have to demonstrate uh, that uh, we are able to improve the first step, uh, that means the Mittendeckel, with other instruments. And we have few time, because five years is really few times. The, the five years is four now. Just, <laughs> we have only four now. now. Yeah? And uh, uh, what's happened in one year? Very few. Uh, I think uh, I, I uh, appreciate uh, both speeches um, I heard, uh, both in, in the third of, uh, of uh, um, Orioli, Valentino Orioli. Uh, I think uh, what is interesting in the Vienna model is uh, the attempt to change the meaning of social housing. In all countries in Europe, social housing means uh, social uh, means uh, uh, residence for poor people. And this must be changed. Social housing must be a model for all the people, not only for poor people. And this uh, is the cue for the success of the Vienna model. This is uh, what, what uh, Martin Wagner said, uh, entpolitisierung von der Wohnungsfrage. No? The depolitization of, uh, of the social housing problem. I think this is the main, uh, uh, main um, um, uh, uh, element of interesting for me uh, that uh, demonstrate the success of uh, the Vienna uh, example. Thank you, Marco. Uh, I wonder I mean, whether Ga Gabo yeah, is... Gabo is there. <laughs> yeah, Gabo I is there. Okay, yeah. okay, let's try yeah. now. Uh, no, 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 just, I just wanted to answer to Marco and yeah, I'm just okay. waiting for my sure. file to transfer. I will, uh, I will be with you in a moment. No, but Marco, I think my argument will be in my talk the moment I can do it. The opposite, I do think that it's actually about politicizing it. And, and, and I will also try to show to what extent uh, Red Vienna did yeah. that. Um, yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know, I know, I'm trying <laughs> my best. Okay, but, um, so let, let's get uh, the PowerPoint no, now. No, 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 it's like this, but this, uh, I just wanted to intervene in the discussion while I'm waiting for my PowerPoint to transfer. Um, so I don't want, I didn't want to interrupt the, the discussion. Give me two more minutes. It's coming up in a moment. Okay. I just need to come <laughs> <with> it. <laughs> in a certain sense, I, I cannot. I don't want to interpret it what uh, Gabo will will say, but I agree with their objection to uh, Marco Pogacnik. I understand what he means when with uh, in politizing, uh, Abba, uh, it's a, a great political issue. He has explained us 
the 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 social housing for, for everyone. So this is not a, a, a depoliticized issue. It's a very political choice you, you have to do. It changes the relations uh, to the relationship you have, you have to, with the market, with the the kind, the form of life. Even people living there, dwelling there, means to share part of the house to use it together and so on. So it, it changes completely uh, the, the kind of life, you, the way of life you have to 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 maintain there. So uh, this is a great political issue. But it, I understand the sense of the politization that Wagner mentioned. Uh, it's different, but this, it, this, this is politics, not a, a, a policy reevaluating re politics. Yeah, 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 I agree, but my was a quotation of Martin Wagner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. <laughs> Martin quotation. I understand the meaning of his quotation, but we can translate it in our daily language, uh, emphasizing the political issue it contains. Okay. So, Jacopo, I think we can open to other people since Gabo needs some more time. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, let's let's uh, let's open the floor to discussion for a, a Valentina may, or anyone. May I add something? Please. Yeah, uh, about the the fact that uh, rent cap is not enough. We need uh, building activity. I try to show you something about building activity. If I can share my screen for a while, okay? Can you see it? These are the scenery uh, concerning uh, climate and uh, CO2 emissions in Bologna. Uh, the, the, the scenery on the upper uh, part of the screen is the business as usual. So if you continue like that, uh, what will happen in 2050? Uh, substantially, we will stay like, uh, like we are now. <laughs> Uh, the, mm, the other scenery concerns, uh, uh, of course, what we have to do to uh, reach uh, carbon neutrality in 2050. And you see, for example, that uh, in violet and in red uh, are represented the um, buildings. Uh, in violet, residential, in, in red, uh, other buildings. Uh, so you can appreciate what kind of work we have to do uh, from the climate point of view on buildings uh, for um, reaching uh, climate uh, objectives. So the, the idea of uh, uh, renewal, the idea of uh, substituting and uh, refurbishing buildings and changing uh, um, urban fabrics uh, uh, comes also from uh, this consideration. I, I'm a deputy for urban planning and environment, so that when I think about uh, uh, planning policies, I always must, must also think about uh, climate policies. And this is uh, strongly interconnected. Uh, freezing the city with the uh, rent caps, uh, with the um, instant measure to sustain people is right in the short time, but we have to think uh, in, a, in a broader way to uh, try to um, put uh, good policies for uh, the city environment. So we are we can begin with Gabo. Um, can you see my screen? No, it, it was good oh. just a minute before. Okay, I try it again. Yeah, you did and came back. It came back again, okay. No, not uh, yet. Not yet, so I will do it um, once Do the more. same you did some minute, one <laughs> minute ago. I know, I'm doing my best. So, okay, now I'm going to share. Voila, it looks like my my computer wants to do something. Um, now we are seeing your Bildschirm übertragung. <laughs> okay, I want to just open. Yeah, oh. come on. The, this, Can the you see that? The general screen again? Yes, okay, okay. 
So um, what do you see now? Do you see me? No, do we, we see, don't see anything. Do you see that? No, we just see all the people collected on the screen. Okay. Jacopo, but you, you, you may like... maybe switch your camera on. So, Übertragung starten. So, okay. Okay, I'm sharing now my my. It seems yeah, good. you should see yeah. that. Yeah, very good. Yeah, okay. that's good. Now. That's fine. That's so, fine. Um, okay, perfect. We'll just go like this. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm, and and um, I'm can try to do it full screen, but maybe not. Yeah. I think we'll just stick with that. Is that okay for you? Can you see yeah. the next slide? Yeah. 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 yeah okay, absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. It's not going to be the most beautiful one uh, presentation, but hopefully informative. Okay. Thanks so much for the invitation and sorry that uh, about these uh, problems, uh, which is really um, uh, unusual. Okay. So I'm speaking here as a practicing architect um, um, who has an office in Vienna. I'm also teaching. Um, this is uh, basically already here. I, you see my AA unit standing in front of Karl Marx Hof in Vienna but also in front of the Smithsons um, uh, housing project, was, which was the Robin Hood Gardens, which was just to be demolished. So uh, housing has, is really a big uh, topic of mine in my own practice, in teaching, but also in research. Um, I just published uh, these two books. One is a little booklet on the questions of uh, can we actually um, stay critical um, within like the condition of architecture and its many discontents. And the second one is a study that um, I did commissioned by the uh, Chamber of Labour in Vienna um, on the question of justice in the city. And there we did a lot of research actually on the contemporary housing condition in, in Vienna. Within these notions, I actually um, established or developed a sort of working uh, mode, uh, which I would like to introduce to you, which is basically saying, OK, we um, we need to I, I do think that we need to critique anything that we we actually value. So critiquing is is um, valuing, critiquing is giving something to and, and make, taking care of, caring about something. Uh, so we have the level of critique of the contemporary condition. We have an, a heritage, as we already talked about so much uh, about, for instance, in Vienna, Red Vienna, and I can also see that you cannot export uh, this heritage to any other place. And we have an idea about another, maybe another world, or at least another kind of future, and certainly about alternatives in the future to conditions of housing, uh, which at this moment are so internationally highly problematic. So um, with that, I would just give you one example of like, let's say contemporary critique. Um, this is um, a facade in Vienna, a um, construction facade, uh, which um, may be difficult to read. I will um, read it to you. It says that it's not ad busting. It does say, you don't have to live in these apartments to love Vienna, owning them will do. So I guess this is um, what's why I do like this image, even though I don't like its message, is that it brings uh, financialization of housing, uh, the commodification of, uh, of apartments uh, within not only city centers, but in this moment, of course, in the very city center of Vienna to a point. Um, so it's not anymore about um, uh, living there, but owning there. We all know that. But it's an inscription in a facade. But in Vienna, we also have inscriptions in facades that are actually much more prominent, as there are many more, but um, a lot of people don't see them anymore. And these are the inscriptions on the housing facades of Red Vienna, of exactly the time we're speaking about. And it's like in on every one of their buildings. So it says in big red letters, built by the city of Vienna in the years so and so by the means of the housing tax. Now, can anyone imagine a government at the moment who will actually a, invent a highly progressive redistribution tax and then proudly put it in red letters on the houses they were actually able to build from this tax? This is exactly what I would actually try to promote to say, OK, this is one of many tests that we are doing, saying, OK, well, let's project this into the future. And if that is also difficult to read, then it's because of the green facade and the question of ecology, of course, um, to say maybe this is a city house. Maybe it's not built anymore by the, by the city, could be, but it is certainly made possible by the city of Vienna. 
in the years, in this time, 20, 24, 25, 30, whatever, by the means of, and now the question is, which tax? Is it a heritage tax? Is it a CO2 tax? Is it a luxury tax? What's the luxury taxes of the future or of the contemporary moment? So I do believe that we actually need to, to take some achievements of the past and project them into the future and actually, yes, politicize them. <clears throat> That's um, what I've um, been working on in this book that was already mentioned by Jacopo. Thank you. Um, this is uh, unfortunately at this moment only in German. I'm working on a translation on city conflicts and uh, based on the theory of radical democracy. And um, <clears throat> it's actually split in three chapters and uh, the three chapters are called politics, planning and popular agency. It's not by coincidence that it's three Ps. Um, it is also countering the notion of public-private partnerships, of PPPs, um, substituting uh, public uh, investments or public engagement in public duty. <clears throat> but it's also a combination of three Ps, which I believe we really need in order to get us out of a, for instance, the housing crisis, which is politics which is literally planning and a planning attitude and also planning theory about um, how to deal within the dilemmatic um, conditions. Um, and also, and most of all, to, to be able to actually bring politics and planning together in alliance with popular agency. So, um, okay, I'll, let's, let's critique um, Vienna today. Vienna, actually, if we critique it, we critique it on a very high level. And you all have heard this already this afternoon, and you've heard a lot, and thank you very much. And some of that may now actually be repetitive. But the public funding of housing per year in Vienna is about um, 650 million euros, and it's only 5% of the communal budget. So I want to actually um, relativize um, how much money that is. It's a lot, but it's also not a lot. It's like there's money. The question is, uh, what is it um, uh, being spent on? What is maybe more important is that this money is actually spent on object subsidy and not subject subsidy. There's some subject sub subsidy, but it was also already mentioned by Matthias, the strong belief that we are using public money for infrastructure. And the second strong belief is that housing is infrastructure. Housing is a public duty and it serves as an infrastructure actually for, we could call it, housing security of people, like Wohnsicherheit. Um, so um, um, just to kind of relativize the number, it's fairly small, but it's uh, important and it has been important. Has been important for the fact that, as also, as also been mentioned, 60% more or less of the Viennese live in municipal or subsidized housing. And 75% of the Viennese rent. And renting is really an important concept here, because if we think about it, renting actually is collectively the better pension plan for a whole society than owning. Uh, because if we have like a whole, if we have society rent in rent controlled and, hope, and in the best case, some sort of collectivized housing structures, then as we know, rents actually tend in a normal structure tend to get lower or at least could stay the same since houses also get paid off over some year. But also in Vienna, the situation is changing as um, uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, growth was enormous. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, financialization and uh, speculation also uh, took uh, hold of Vienna. So um, there's a less housing production of the communal um, and the uh, and the limited profit organizations, which is here in red, uh, the Gemeinnützigen Bauträger, and more production of private um, investors. And that uh, changes the proportion, and that by that also disrupts the, the prices um, and actually also changes the numbers of um, Viennese living in social housing. So we actually have, uh, with this growing uh, city, there was an enormous kind of uh, growing um, uh, building uh, market, um, immobiliar market. Um, uh, I want to really um, support, I don't remember who said it, uh, if sometimes if I give tours in Vienna and I, I, I take the joy of actually asking people and standing in front of two buildings, um, which one would be private and which one would be subsidized in Vienna. And they usually would actually say it's the opposites because like, 
the private will be of lower quality at the moment than the subsidized one because of the quality control um, based uh, in the kind of funding system in Vienna, but also because at this moment, or until recently, you could simply build whatever, however shitty, uh, sorry for the word, uh, and you knew that actually people would rent or even buy it. So, but again, coming back to the high level, um, uh, rental price in social housing. And now we, if I say social housing, I do mean communal or like, let's say council housing blocks and also subsidized uh, rental. Subsidized being um, built and uh, maintained and uh, uh, coordinated by low uh, uh, limited profit organizations and associations or uh, council housing by the, by the city of Vienna. However, uh, this is also changing. Yeah? Um, this is, I'm sorry, some of the diagrams are in German. These are kind of part of our, our research for the um, uh, Chamber of Labor. So this right diagram shows how the rents are rising, however, in different levels. The communal ones, the community, um, like city-owned um, uh, ones are the lowest. Then we have the limited profit ones and the private ones, guess what, are rising the highest. And, and that's the perfidious thing um, in Austria, or like in this case in Vienna, is 70% of the private um, market uh, housing units are currently only rented out with a short-term contract of like uh, around three years. So that puts people in the enormous pressure um, of like having to constantly ask yourself um, where, where you're going to be in three years and also being in the pressure, under pressure of... Um, the private um, uh, uh, um, owners of the of the flats, um, and they actually make use of it by asking for more money because they know that if people are actually dependent on them, they may not go and um, make sure that they get their money back. So there's a real dependency and um, um, you could say um, a misuse of the system, uh, but it's not misuse because now we actually at this point that we have to differentiate because the city level, what can the city do and the state level, and here you see on the right, it's the state that actually um, has the Mietrecht um, um, uh, in like the, the, the law about um, uh, the housing sit, um, renting conditions. So the fact that there can be short term contracts um, for rents um, are actually um, decided on a state level. Also, that um, social housing can actually be bought. Um, so, uh, and this is really um, scandalous, I would say, um, like how many years after Margaret Thatcher, Vienna, and not Vienna, this is again Austria, the Austrian state um, is actually not, is allowing um, a large portion of those who move into um, subsidized housing to buy their apartments after five years. And that has been, before it was 10 years, now it's even five years. So there's a real tendency of the states to make people actually get property ownership while the city is actually fighting and defending its rental structure and keeping the houses, uh, keeping the units uh, within collective um, ownership. And what is here in German, Lagezuschlag is also uh, problematic. It's basically adding to the rent um, a proportion of uh, money that is simply uh, dedicated to the quality of the sites, of the infrastructure and so on. This is literally, we could say, the public is producing the quality of a site and the private um, um, person, private um, uh, institution, the um, equity fund, um, uh, whatever um, large scale global international um, owners of the housing are actually taking uh, the profit from it. So um, you'll see me kind of jump back and forth between um, praise and critique. Um, uh, municipal housing has been or uh, is currently, as in the past, actually spread all over the city. You can see that there's more at the edges, but there's literally no district at the moment that does not have municipal housing or funded housing. So that's, of course, a celebrated um, uh, it has been celebrated a lot because uh, it also kept the city from having two diverse uh, qualities of uh, locations. Um, you could say like there's no such thing as values or um, or really areas where you where where I mean this is also changing and it's all dispute, disputed. But um, uh, um, I do think this is a really great um, quality. Yet um, um, 
kind of until 2000. Vienna built municipal housing until 2004, and then it stopped. So um, and after that, uh, funded housing was um, uh, by by limited profit organizations was of course continued to be built, uh, but it was a big, big, big mistake to actually stop the tradition, the kind of um, history of communal of um, uh, municipality housing uh, const self construction. Um, with a lot of critique, um, the, the mayor and the city actually uh, decided to restart again, actually have to change to this, um, and um, started a new new um, momentum, more or less uh, 10, 12 years later, to say, okay, we're going to do Gemeindebauten again. However, if you want to destroy a system, it really takes a lot of effort to kind of uh, rebuild it. So we've only seen one new uh, municipal uh, housing um, complex uh, so far. Then, of course, is also the place where um, uh, we have these iconic um, swimming pools on the roof of social housing. Um, this is Alt Erla, and it's like one of the um, kind of maybe more unusual. It's, um, it's in this, built in the 70s, 80s. Uh, but uh, what it has become is um, a symbol that uh, with mass housing and uh, with uh, social housing, you can have luxury, which you may not be able to have uh, if you're like living by yourself in or owning or whatever. I, I always say like with mass, we just did a large um, uh, Bauträger Wettbewerb uh, where certainly we also have a swimming, uh, a big, uh, large, good, good swimming pool on the roof um, to 25 meter um, water uh, basin and saying, okay, well, that's something you cannot afford if you have your own house, but you can only afford because of mass, because of uh, many people living together and um, to see that really also not as a burden, but as equality. Another much de debated or disputed uh, topic is who is to live in these places. Um, as we already heard, it's um, fairly um, affordable. So um, in fact, 80% um, of the Viennese would be eligible to move into um, communal, uh, into social housing uh, due to their um, um, income, are the, the income levels are very high, um, the income um, are borders. So basically, um, um, what has been said, it's like it features middle class quite a bit, um, but it doesn't, it only has place for 55 or 60 percent. So there is, um, unfortunately, or others would say naturally, um, a competition about, or not a competition, but a question who is to get in. And in fact, there's one quality, I would say, that nobody ever gets thrown out. So uh, you see in the right corner, you see a politician who has become very um, kind of a, the spokesperson for still living in a social housing unit um, and uh, not moving out. And and that's also really important that guarantees diversity of, um, of people living in these um, uh, spaces, in these plots, which of course is only true also for well restored and renovated housing um, uh, blocks. Um, the poorer ones are also um, places where people would not stay if they cannot afford uh, if they can afford to move out. But still, no, everybody stays, and everybody at this moment stay, pays the same low rent, no matter how much people earn, how, no matter how much they actually um, um, evolved um, in income or so in their lives. But, and this we will talk about this in a moment, is um, uh, the city of Vienna, and this is I'm a big, uh, a very a much a high, a big critic of it, uh, is uh, it installed a sort of Viennese first policy, which actually now asks people to be uh, registered in Vienna for three years or up to five years, or the longer the better, the earlier you get the place. So uh, basically the... Um, the fight over the housing units um, are actually is done by nationality or by being there, who has been there the longest. Okay, um, it has been mentioned, uh, the Wohnfonds and the Vienna Land Procurement and Urban Renewal Fund, which is really the important base um, for the success of um, social housing. Um, with active land politics, you actually can control the quality by, and um, this has been mentioned also by, in this case, uh, in Vienna, quite a bit by the so-called Bauträger Wettbewerbe, by competitions, where the city of uh, Vienna actually, due to this um, fund, uh, makes, um, uh, provides the land for a low price, um, and then actually assures the quality by making sure that actually teams compete um, 
with good projects, which they, which are really like uh, these are contracts that are really ser taken very serious in in with kind of in response to receiving um, to then kind of getting the um, low price land. An issue which has been really really big in Vienna, because um, you remember the many millions or the the five percent of the budget of the uh, Vienna um, um, uh, city budget actually could not be spent in some years, not because uh, there wasn't enough money for uh, like uh, enough housing funding money, but there wasn't enough land. In fact, um, the problem is um, that, um, and this is I'm sure an issue everywhere, uh, uh, since land is still an asset, a kind of a commodity, um, land grabbing and land hoarding has also not stopped from Vienna. So um, in the end of 2018, um, the red-green uh, government actually um, introduced a new zoning category, which I do think is really interesting. It's um, called funded housing. So um, it's the difference is it's not called housing anymore, but funded housing. So it means that once, um, let's say, a field, um, a green field is turned, um, is rezoned into housing, once it's called funded housing, it actually um, means that 70, up to 75% of this land must become funded housing. And funded housing is effectively um, linked to a limited um, price of the land. And this limited price of land is actually down to 10% of what you ha would have to pay on the private market. So in fact, um, this uh, building law has of course been called by by landowners, quasi expropriation, um, quasi expropriating them from their already speculated um, uh, profit, speculated uh, gain in the future of their um, of their land holding. And it's been, uh, let's see, it's at least been successful in the sense that it uh, makes sure that there is a city that would actually take, um, that would actually use instruments that are there in order to stop speculation, and that just to show that actually reduces speculation, of course, because then actually uh, those who just do that um, go somewhere else where they don't fear a stronger government. So um, um, with the last image kind of, this is um, um, one social housing um, uh, compound uh, next to the new uh, central station in Vienna. We could uh, walk through Vienna and see a lot of, um, at this moment, funded housing. A, there was a lot of, um, um, building activity, but also, as uh, has been mentioned, um, uh, much more private um, uh, housing. And um, I totally agree uh, with my spe the speaker before um, that actually we do have to ask ourselves in the future if the historic answer of building, building, building ever more um, to a housing crisis uh, will not be the future answer as we have also an ecological crisis. <laughs> So I think that we will concentrate a lot on redistribution of already built space, but we'll talk about this in a moment. So let's look from now the critique of Vienna into um, conditions of red Vienna. And I'll try to not repeat what had been said. Um, Manfredo Tafuri was already um, was um, um, uh, uh, mentioned and um, um, it's something about um, uh, not repeating, um, as you've already discussed a lot about him, um, he was critiquing um, uh, on very different levels, um, uh, Red Vienna, and I would say that, and this is what I also like deal with in my book, um, that um, with this um, maximalist um, or um, radicalist um, critique um, of Red Vienna, I would of course fully agree the moment it is, it is about um, that um, there would have had to be, and uh, I think that's our future goal, I guess, uh, um, this part that goes beyond the reformist approach um, yet. And this is uh, what I, I'm drawing on is like, it it is a realized um, socialist political concept to such an extent that it nearly and very often is used today as a utopian concept. Because in fact, uh, what has been realized then is quite actually difficult at this moment, at this very nearable moment to uh, to to think, uh, to, to even see as thinkable in so many places today. 
Um, what happened then, it was 64,000 apartment buildings in a very short time. I, I already told you that now today, like it's 220 and 200,000. So um, it's um, it was a very good uh, basic stock. Um, it was in a very short time. This is a um, narrative sketch about how uh, it took only like between uh, 1914, like low, and then the last years, um, complete kind of um, growth in numbers of um, of uh, Gemeinde bau, uh, housing. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, many more, um, um, not housing, it was not only about housing, as was already mentioned, but I would actually like to talk about the conditions about it. Um, so if we think about the conditions around 1920, there was, and also thanks to my speakers before, there was not from the Social Democratic uh, Labour Party, but, but already before, an enormously good protection of the tenants good rent control. And maybe this is the, the thing to learn the most. Um, if you cannot make money of the housing need of others, if there's no profit in housing, then there's no speculation in housing. And that is what that that's also what happened then. There was no speculation, but there was also barely any private investment in housing uh, because you couldn't do too much profit. So the sincere lack of housing, this this interest of private investment um, um, actually made land prices also go down and not skyrocket as today. Um, so you, the city government actually did have to do something. And if we would think, and it was already mentioned, that Vienna becomes a federal state, uh, it gets uh, tax sovereignty. Now you could think uh, today, if you have a housing crisis and uh, not enough private uh, investors, you could imagine that the government says, oh, we need to put out incentives for the private investors. We need to support them with land, with um, tax reduction, I don't know what. Vienna actually did the opposite and said, okay, well, we actively purchase land. And as already has been mentioned, kind of um, a clear redistribution policy by inventing, inventing, let's say it sounds so um, inventive, but by developing, conceptualizing luxury taxes. And then, of course, also in addition, improvement of social health services, um, most importantly, using and integrating culture and recreation to really kind of see this as a hegemonic um, uh, political concept. Um, and as I mentioned, um, made um, quite a lot of um, good stock uh, for the city development afterwards. I would actually disagree. I think it was Matthias who said that. Um, I don't think it failed. I think it was made, it was stopped by a literal uh, war, a, a kind of burger creek. Um, so this, this was a clear kind of um, um, uh, um, effort from the other political side to make that stop. So I think the failing is a bit too uh, weak in terms of like that it was sincerely actually fought um, and um, and quite a lot of people actually uh, gave their lives um, in, in supporting um, even literally from these uh, fortresses, which Manfredo Tafuri called uh, to be too much kind of fortress and too much home-like, too much castle-like. However, it was also this, these houses that actually made the people really fight for um, their achievement. Well, um, this redistribution uh, policy was already mentioned. I think today we cannot imagine any kind of strong red hand anymore um, um, taking, so to say, the money from um, from the rich. But we, we need other strategies and other rhetorics. But what we can learn is that there was rhetorics uh, and there was a lot of um, actually uh, engagement, um, engagement into kind of um, uh, also the mediation and information communication, um, what what the politics actually meant. Um, same as I already mentioned, um, the facades, um, uh, facade writings, inscriptions um, about um, how these houses were going uh, to uh, to be built. So um, I already mentioned it, and it's something that I really have a sincere interest in: is like hegemonic um, uh, politics, uh, like how to um, step by step also um, really um, uh, kind of and let's say like on a, from a critical standpoint but also but also from one that says okay how do we actually really achieve um, politically um, such a goal as, as was the goal of Red Vienna. Um, so um, um, 
I mean, sure, you all know that there's a lot of investment in the proletarian culture, the idea of a new man. They even invented the Red Christmas, which of course um, uh, sounds uh, completely counterintuitive. Um, there was investment in citing and in naming. And I would say it's uh, both are antagonistic statements in this um, one of them. Very famous one is Karl Marxhof. A lot of historians have debated about the fact that um, uh, this piece of land was just coincidentally also available. Um, so um, it wouldn't be such a citing statement. However, I would say to have um, tax, um, tax sovereignty and to have a piece of land still does not mean that you're placing this Karl Marxhof there. Uh, and I think that's kind of the that's that 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 is a clear political um, statement and um, momentum. They employed um, uh, famous or not so famous, but then also um, like uh, now famous architects such as also Schütze-Lihotsky, who then later on actually moved to Frankfurt because she also critiqued uh, Red Vienna for being too reformist and not uh, develop not investing enough also in the new um, aesthetics of. Um, a revolution or of a, a real change, so, which maybe also was really not um, not ever meant to be. So um, what I'm interested in is in fact really the heritage of Red Vienna and um, I would see it um, similar by reading it together with uh, Derrida, saying an inheritance is always the reaffirmation of a debt, but a critical, selective and filtering reaffirmation. So um, I do think that we have a lot to filter off Red Vienna, and to look really critically in uh, what did we also inherit with what has been what is celebrated today, but what should we also really get rid of? Um, and so it is a good base for new perspectives, for alternatives, for utopias, but also in order in in a filtered way. One of these filterings is that um, it has been mentioned. Uh, it it has to be discussed um, what and how actually salaries, um, how working conditions, how gender politics, how gender gaps and so on relate to housing um, and the, 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 the kind of the housing price, so to say. Honestly, you can have the best um, uh, social housing units uh, for some women, and I just did a study about that. Some women can literally not afford housing at all with what they earn, um, no matter how kind of uh, low the housing uh, unit would be. So there is, of course, and it's been, it's been said, uh, there is this 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 absolutely needed um, uh, uh, collective, uh, uh, like uh, um, alliance of um, uh, thinking, working conditions, asking about um, uh, salaries, about payment in general, about maybe um, uh, security on other levels than by earning uh, together with um, uh, want security, with um, living security. But then also, um, I already mentioned it briefly, is um, if we look into the history, then there was also an allocation system of Red Vienna, which also featured to some extent Viennese first, which also already had embedded a sort of uh, filtering out of uh, those who were not already here those who were not uh, part of um, the nation, those who were not part of Vienna and so on. So this is something that uh, we, like like Vienna had been a city of um, migration and Vienna is that city and a lot of our cities are. So we actually have to find um, a way, not only a way, but um, um, actually maybe become a sanctuary city. I guess that's what I would uh, add to the new municipalism um, discussion that that we had this afternoon. And then there was a lot of standardization. Um, so you'd actually only get turnkey apartments. Uh, so finished, completely finished um, and all kind of with the standards. The idea had to be that the kitchen is really separated from the corridor. Um, however, and that's interesting, the kitchen wasn't so small as in Frankfurt. So there was an idea about the family using the kitchen together. Uh, but very difficult um, actually within the paternalistic system, uh, like Red Vienna politicians certainly kind of knew how people would want to live or how they would have, have to live, so to say. So what was missing is support of self-initiative, um, support of self build support of self-organization, only to some extent, as of course there was alternatives in what I would call, if we call Red Vienna an alternative, then 
then I found it interesting to actually look into the alternatives in this alternative, maybe kind of hidden futures, lost futures that um, to 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 kind of um, take and and um, project again, kind of beyond our moment. Um, one of them, and um, it's currently um, quite some people are actually uh, looking into it, is the Viennese settler movement which was a, a very powerful self-help movement. Uh, you can see in all these photographs, women being out there actually sub building their houses. Um, um, not to say that um, that's something that, again, uh, don't get me wrong, nothing of that is to be inherited one-to-one -one or literally, but um, I think that the empowerment um, and, the, and the, then it was not at all a political statement, but it was them literally out of housing need, um, squatting land, at the edges of the city and uh, organizing housing themselves. So with um, then other flows, um, actually yeah. Margarete Schutilihotsky, yeah. Gabo, uh, yeah. Can we? Can you try to bring it to a close? Otherwise, we won't have yes, time I for will. discussion. I will absolutely. Okay. Um, just quickly going through them, um, kind of looking into core houses um, and cooking houses, um, uh, women's movement uh, that all are kind of also part of this story, not being told so much. And um, to bring it to a conclusion, I just um, want to quickly run through two projects, uh, which um, uh, really quickly I recently did. One of them, um, it's uh, for a group of people, it's called, they're called Schlor. It's a solidarity economy, self-governing, collective living. They found themselves um, a site in Vienna, um, like which we are actually um, a, an existing site um, that we are changing. And what they're doing there is basically um, um, they are, um, with this project, um, organizing, um, um, being one project of many, um, hopefully to grow, similar to the Mietshäuser Syndicate in Germany. Um, and the second project, uh, so-called, uh, we called it International City House, uh, also a self-help, self-organization group that took, uh, that rented this house that you see here as a total and started to actually um, to build themselves a one kitchen house. So the entire house is actually a community um, with a kitchen in the ground floor. Um, they are self-organizing and actually solid in a solidarity way, um, supporting each other, the people with papers, with no papers, different colors of the skins, um, uh, different incomes, uh, different sexuality, um, living together, building the house together. And um, it's intersectional because of the intersectionality of the group and also the section of the house itself, which we were lucky as architects to actually be able to support. Um, why am I saying this? Because there is at this moment a desperate need of people to find accessibility to housing. Um, and they're kind of, they're, they're using new, new tools and new instruments to do it themselves. And that's something that if we think about radical uh, democracy, then it must be about um, supporting um, such initiatives just as much as um, radically democratizing the housing um, um, production of Vienna. And maybe that's where I will stop and, um, and actually come back to the very um, basic question which we could discuss together collectively. Was that a good enough uh, stop? <laughs> Thank you, Gabo. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for this very engaging okay. talk. I, uh, I would ask the speak. Sorry? Okay. Uh, did you already take... Uh, am I already with you back? Yeah. Or do I you, share the screen? You, no, no, you don't You don't need to share the screen. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Okay. I would, so I would ask the speak. Me? No, yeah, no. We can, yes, we can we, you are still sharing your screen. Okay, so I'm stopping that. Okay. Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, very good. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine now. So I would ask the speakers uh, if they want to react or ask questions uh, before we open the floor to the to the audience. So Gabo, Marco, uh, Valentina, Matti, Ezra. If you have questions, to please feel free to ask them. Or if you maybe, want to react and comment. Yeah, maybe I have uh, a point of intersection uh, between uh, the um, Berlin. Sorry, maybe I have to put my video on yes. as well. Can you see me? Um, a point of intersection uh, 
between Vienna and Berlin in terms of uh, radical democracy uh, and what uh, that might uh, tell to us uh, in relation to municipalism discussions and so on and so forth. Um, the Iba Altbau um, example that I just gave, uh, it was happening actually at the moment when the term radical democracy uh, by Ernest de Lacla and Chantal Mouffe was um, uh, suggested as a form of plural democracy. Uh, they were proposing it uh, against popular democracy or um, the, let's say, the major, uh, the tyranny of majority, if you want to call it that way. And uh, Iba Altba was actually, um, you know, one of the challenges uh, that it faced uh, from, I would say, more conservatives was that it wasn't democratic because what the immigrants want in their apartments would not be necessarily wanted by the Germans as a whole. You know, the majority wouldn't want those kinds of idiosyncratic apartments that Iba Altba was ending in uh, based on what the immigrants want. So I think that was a very good, that tension was a very good um, case in point about the uh, difference between, let's say, popular democracy and radical democracy and how you know, it's not, democracy should not mean uh, the tyranny of majority. It should not necessarily mean that one size or what whatever the majority wants exactly. should be all. So the Iba Altba was uh, moving towards, uh, I think, radical democracy, even though the term was just being proposed at the time, uh, or moving towards plural democracy in making um, uh, the demands of the minority uh, also reflected in the urban space. So um, bringing that, that back to our discussions about municipalism and so on and so forth, maybe we also need to think uh, not only on federal level, not only on city level, but also on the neighborhood level, uh, even maybe on the building level uh, to really uh, truly democratize uh, architecture. Just one size fits all, just the city deciding about uh, all neighborhoods as if they are same uh, would not uh, necessarily bring that radical democratic gesture. So I thought the Berlin Alpa, Kreuzberg, Kottbusser Tor area and uh, what Gabu was talking about had uh, another intersection or similarity and I wanted to point that out. Gabu, do you want to pick up the nice. question? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's very nice that you um, bring uh, together these... Um, uh, Ezra, you can stay with us, no? It's like uh, we're speaking into the void otherwise. Um, like I lost the face. Um, no, super nice to, to bring that up because um, uh, <laughs> thanks for, for sticking uh, with us. Um, it's, um, uh, I do think that there's a real, like, and I'm really super interested in the, in the difference between popular uh, and, um, and radical democracy and, uh, and also populism. Yeah? And then when it comes to mass housing, the, um, like this is what you can actually really learn from Vienna in the negative sense. Yeah, or like this learn is uh, how do we get beyond this paternalism that it was embedded in modernist housing generally and has been actually really um, continued with architects, with politicians, with um, with uh, associations, knowing how people want to live, yeah, or knowing how we spend the money if it's public money, knowing how it can only be, and. Um, and there's a lot of work to do, and yet um, the projects that we are seeing, and that I saw, have also mentioned um, by other speakers, um, are only test cases because um, it's still to be actually tested in mass housing. That's what I'm really interested in, and that's what's really the most difficult. Yeah? How can we actually the, have have customized mass housing, allowing for a real um, engagement with the people? but also not asking necessarily only for it um, because a lot of people simply don't have time nor interest. We know all the stories, all the issues about participation. It's not about participation. The question is how can we ensure accessibility? How can we ensure the, the freedom or the, the kind of possibilities to change something and to engage with it uh, if we want, if somebody wants, if somebody doesn't want, we have to make sure that actually there's a good provision of housing that has a lot a good prior, um, a good diversity, a choice. Actually, maybe it's about choices. Yeah, choice where you want to live and how you want to live, and that has a lot to do with economics, but also a lot to do with the culture of um, of housing and the and the idea of housing that has been also, of course, um, inherited. Ma yes. Matthias, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I'd, 
I, I can directly connect to this. Um, we are in the process of uh, trying to find out how uh, this kind of, uh, of of radical democracy can look like in uh, these big social housing blocks that we live in. Here we had a um, we spent a year on on uh, on doing uh, research on it. Uh, how and if uh, our neighbors here, low income groups, decades of political and social exclusion, uh, how uh, and if these people want to. Um, want to somehow self-manage parts or uh, and how much of, of, of their of their surroundings of the houses and so on and um, and we found that the vast majority three quarters uh, have a very positive attitude towards this one quarter says they are already in in some way support in in, in, in support networks uh, that take the form of self-management and um, and, and it was obvious that there are super different characters, super different types of, uh, of self-management that is necessary. And especially those most marginalized and most subaltern um, need self-management that is effective in uh, supporting them in their daily life because there's so much poverty and there's so much exclusion. When we did our first demonstrations here, people were asking, is this legal? Because they never went on a demonstration, and it was, uh, and and they and they didn't even think that they would be allowed to do that, just like other Germans would. And um, and in, in the same study, we also found that on average, people here pay forty one percent of their income on housing, and this is like more than mm. ten times what uh, what was in in Vienna. And I have the the concern that the municipalist approaches that uh, that are emerging, especially uh, here in this district, uh, are geared towards, uh, oriented towards what we call Projekte Szene. Uh, you have you have middle class uh, uh, academics who have very strong uh, social capital and uh, and know their ways to uh, to connect to the state apparatus to. Um, get their projects realized, but uh, to overcome this bridge of, of, of uh, uh, the scale, I mean, we're talking about 1,300 flats in this, in, at yeah, Koti, yeah. and uh, at the same time, um, uh, the, it, it's a different class, and uh, and political approaches to, to, to implement uh, democratic uh, processes in, in housing and in architecture, I think, must make a choice uh, in regard to to these uh, questions of race and class and, and gender, of course, and so on, uh, and um, and this is where we are struggling at the moment. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge win that uh, at least uh, on a rhetorical and symbolic level, uh, the idea of participation and so on is uh, is recognized, but uh, we are still not quite there yet when we talk about which classes and which biographies and which knowledge, which capital is recognized in this regard. Uh, so uh, maybe we can talk about uh, what color the balcony is, but we cannot co-decide uh, about the investment, about modernization and so on. Uh, exactly. So, um, um, I, yeah, I, um, I, I can absolutely uh, connect uh, to this previous input. No, uh, Matthias, you, I see it um, can I just uh, quickly sure. answer because I see it I see it completely the same way. Like we have um, processes that make them decide the color of the swings, yeah, uh, while the houses are sold of their assets, so to say. Like basically, um, this this is what radical democracy would actually mean. Like uh, how uh, like and and I believe that we need a combination of um, of institutionalizing, yeah. Of really also taking responsibility for like representation, plus allowing as much space as possible for self-organization when wanted. Yeah? But also not to kind of um, and it, it sounds really great what you're doing. Yeah? Like I'm on Saturday, I'm in a house in in Vienna, which is awfully run down. You know the whole kind of story that all the cities know. And then the question is, we have the second meeting with people there, and we know it may be the last one because. At the end of the day, if nobody can help, they're like, why should we meet? Yeah, if you if like there's no position, no power to no real. So this is like to bring that to a political level, and this is why I believe we must politicize it. But also, and maybe this is the double move, 
um, keep it open without the, po the kind of politics for for what is what is also means simply everyday life engagement with your surrounding. Yeah? So I, I understand this double move totally, but we should connect there. I think it's it's really interesting to 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 look into all this. Um, there's a lot also in Vienna. We're trying to bring that to a ma to a mass and class level. Yeah? The question really of how to 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 get the bridge done. And this is, for instance, with um, my study on on the real precarious, like the, those who are constantly facing nearly eviction and uh, losing their homes. This is where you are like, um, they realize this number is so high and it's so based on on the awful disparity of like um, um, in, in income. And we are living, we're living in two different spheres. There's like one late last anecdote. Uh, and in a conference on um, uh, kind of uh, supporting uh, homeless people, um, there was an in, actual investor of a profit um, uh, housing association, not not limited profit housing association. And the woman says, OK, I don't know in the middle of the month if I will heat or eat. And he says next takes the, the, the mic and speaks and says, it's so true. Housing has become so expensive. I really have to also help my son if to, to afford the 700,000 euro apartment in the seventh district. And it's not a joke. He really thinks in a way he's in the same boat of like the housing market being uh, so uh, unfair. And to, to speak really about this enormous income and, and, and to bring glass back here, yeah? I think it's so, it would be so important. Th thank you, Gabo. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask Marco if he wants to say something, and maybe I I, I have a question. Uh, Marco, do you think that the notion of progetto in the Fury can be related to the notions of radical democracy? I tried in my um, speech to to. Um, enlarge the interpretation of uh, uh, Vienna Rosa uh, by uh, Tafuri. Because uh, we, uh, when, we, when we speak about Tafuri and Vienna Rosa, we uh, intend uh, always his book, uh, 1918. Uh, but I said uh, there is another chapter in, the, in his interpretation and they last chapter is uh, in uh, this essay that uh, he uh, published uh, 84. Uh, in this chapter, he uh, because in the book, uh, he mm -hmm. um, 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 <clears throat> discuss the uh, case of Vienna under the interpretation of Martin Wagner, of Martin Wagner. And uh, he says, Vienna is a parasite uh, city. Uh, Vienna uh, doesn't, didn't want to uh, organize uh, um, herself as a work of uh, economy, only a work of consume. And uh, but in the last, uh, in this last uh, um, um, essay about realismus and architecture. Uh, he underlined the great uh, importance of uh, this experience uh, in, in, by founding a new uh, uh, language for architecture, a language uh, grounded uh, in the will of communication. And this is uh, many times underlined by him, the means of communication. Architecture have the mission to communicate to build a narrative, uh, to be near and close uh, to the people. Volkstümliche Sprache, uh, 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 he, he, uh, uh, he wrote, no? Volkstümliche Sprache, a, 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 a language that uh, has to be very close to the people. And uh, <clears throat> this is one element. The second, uh, I, I go back to, to Martin Wagner and his criti criticism to, to Vienna. Uh, <clears throat> um, he said, uh, what in Vienna can be criticized is uh, uh, that uh, 
the municipality of Vienna may, uh, wanted to be uh, the central decision and central organization for for all housing uh, uh, um, uh, enterprise. This is the reason why the Siedlungsbewegung was was damned by the by the Rote Wien. Uh, uh, all the all the money, all the efforts was collected by the uh, uh, Viennese uh, municipality to build the uh, um, the Hofe, these uh, um, super blocks, uh, the super blocks. We see now that Bien Vienna is today much more near to Martin Wagner, <laughs> to Berlin experience in the 20s. Wagner said, uh, said uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the municipality has only to be distributor of uh, money, but we have to uh, promote self-organization in the people. And that is what is now happening. The self-organization, self-building, not. <laughs> I. Uh, you, yeah, microphone, yeah. microphone, microphone. So may I say something here? Yeah, oh. but uh, okay. You, of course, you can react. But then let's open. Let's open the the floor to discussion. Otherwise, the public won't be able to ask questions. So shall I say something? I, I just, oh. Yeah. Because I, I do want to uh, maybe um, put a cautionary mark uh, about uh, the, the easy reconcilability between, let's say, the left European uh, left in the interwar period or even uh, with Tafuri and radical democratic idea. I mean, I think uh, there are countless examples where we see uh, the inability of uh, the left uh, in addressing issues of uh, race uh, and coloniality and so on. So I think, again, the Kreuzberg is a good example uh, where um, the immigrant population today is doubly ex ex uh, uh, exploited because what they built uh, as value is being transferred uh, to the, um, you know, to the wealthy and they're being doubly uh, exploited. But um, I also want to put a cautionary mark because of some of the historical facts that um, we may not know. I mean, my previous book, Architecture and Translation, is about Wagner, Margaret Rutelowski, and all those housing, um, public housing architects in Turkey. Um, and, um, you know, Wagner, for instance, was, you know, all his, I would say, racism came out very, very uh, openly, you know, for him, Asians were childish, stupid, they wouldn't be able to do anything and so on. It was a very different um, person than Bruno Taut, his colleague in, in Germ Germany. So I think uh, when we uh, also add the issue of race, immigration, or the refugee problem today that Europe is, uh, that we didn't discuss, but that Europe is, um, um, you know, not doing so well uh, in terms of um, uh, responding well to the uh, refugee crisis. I think uh, we may get another um, viewpoint about the uh, difficult reconcilability between uh, the, let's say, hardcore left and the radical democracy. I think radical, plural democracy uh, or radical democracy that can also um, deal with issues of uh, minorities, of race, of coloniality, and so on and so forth uh, is... Uh, something different than what Wagner and um, you know some of the interwar left was uh, was promoting hopefully uh, I would open the floor to discussion now because we still have you know about 60 people listening to us maybe they want to ask a question so I was wondering before you know, they do that before they do that maybe I can just answer to Marco because um, yeah of like um marco um i don't know uh if it was a quickly response to my presentation yeah, yeah very quickly if it was a response to my presentation i showed the exemptions uh, exceptions uh, i think that there's a long way to go from paternalistic um, red vienna and contemporary vienna to really a, a radical democracy um uh, status um but um 
there is more and more people demanding it. Yeah? And uh, of course, you could say maybe with the with the um, limited uh, profit organization associations, there the city is literally making possibilities up. Maybe that's what you meant, more than than really kind of popular agency bottom up structures. It's still top down at this moment. Yes, sir. If you want to ask questions, you just need to raise uh, your hand. Of course, it's just on the platform. So you need to click on this kind of uh, yellow hand. <laughs> Andrea, Annalisa. OK, Amir, please. Hi, everyone. Can you sw switch on your camera? It's uh, I, think it's uh, I don't know if you can see me. Yes, we uh, can. Yes, Great. you can now, yeah. Uh, no, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, all of the speaker and the organizers, uh, Jacopo, Andrea, Annalisa, because uh, uh these uh, uh i think these moments are very interesting they're very good uh, and they are also very somehow refreshing uh especially today to me was a big uh, somehow big uh, surprise i didn't know about the uh, policy of uh, vienna today about housing and it, it's very good to hear about the struggles in uh, in berlin also because uh I mean, knowing the Italian situation uh, is very depressing. Uh, yesterday, actually, uh, there was an attempt to establish uh, the a, a law. Uh, yes, last week, uh, actually, there was an attempt from some members of the parliament to uh, to establish a luxury tax and a tax on assets, uh, which was a ridiculously low tax. But uh, basically, it was. Uh, uh, completely, uh, you know, turned down both by the left uh, and the right. Uh, so actually to see that um, uh, like Vienna is uh, spending uh, such a considerable part of its budget uh, on public housing and also that in Berlin, I mean, these kind of struggles that they start bottom up, but uh, somehow they're becoming more and more hegemonic. Uh, this is very uh, actually uh, comforting somehow to to see, and um, at the same time, I, I think that this uh, uh, this uh, idea of uh, self help is very interesting, uh, but in particular in this context because we are uh, talking about um, uh, like uh, social uh, democracy and radical social democratic uh, strategies, and I would say that. Um, I think to, to speak about um, uh, self-help uh, alone as a sort of alternative to neoliberalism is very dangerous because somehow it becomes, uh, you know, uh, we, we remove just uh, any kind of support, any kind of uh, uh, help to people because uh, people, they, they're just able to uh, to do by themselves. And this was the, the whole idea of uh, you know, James Cameron's, the big society, et cetera, et cetera. And also this kind of instrumental use of uh, uh, the rhetoric of the commons that we see everywhere nowadays. Uh, and I think that is very dangerous. But in particular, I think in this context, I mean, if we couple somehow uh, self-help, but also in a way radical uh, social democracy, and w we we bring these two parts, uh, uh, these two kind of struggles together. And of course, uh, there is no radical uh, social democracy without radical politics. You know, I'm very much, uh, you know, operaistic or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tafurian in this sense, but I really think that there is no development whatsoever if there are no uh, struggles, you know. But uh, struggles alone cannot be uh, somehow or perhaps uh, uh, become so hegemonic. So in a way, there should be this sort of uh, alliance between uh, top-down and bottom-up uh, initiatives. Yeah, may I add something? I think. I agree a lot. I mean, in a way, there is uh, in the recent debates, because of the fear of top-down, which I share, 
there's a lot of romanticization of the user agency that the users can do this and so on and so forth. So individual, in other words, is being uh, seen as a solution to neoliberalism, but neoliberalism is, you know, individualism is and neoliberalism are the same thing. So the solution to individualism cannot be individualism. So um, so I think, um, you know, the uh, we need may maybe terms such as solidarity um, or an alliance uh, as of um, policy making and uh, bottom up struggles and so on and so forth. But I agree that too much romanticization of user agency or self-help is not going to um, be super transformative. It, it would, yeah, the solution to individualism cannot be individualism. So we need other terms and we need to uh, bring out other concepts. I mean, solidarity is maybe one thing, but uh, so I, I really appreciate but, this uh, cautionary remark. But oh, well, this is exactly wanna, why. Uh, what, so, sorry, Gabo, just wanted to read Valentina's message because she's on the street, so she cannot uh, join us. She says, uh, concerning your interest in discussion about radical democracy, please know that cities, public administrations as well, need these experiences. If an administration involves its citizens only for discussing about the notion of colors of the facade, well, it needs to learn from its citizens. Public administrators must leave the comfort zone enter in a kind of trading zone together with the citizens. Perhaps I'm optimistic, but if I wasn't, I shouldn't have done the vice, uh, where I acted as vice mayor. Maybe that's a good one to, to respond to anyway. Sorry, Gabo, yeah, please. Uh, Amir, um, I think this is exactly why to, that's why I said we need to politicize it, yeah? because only to romanticize it in terms of like self-help is not the solution at all. Um, but politicizing and institutionalizing and actually seeing, uh, taking responsibility within kind of uh, politics to counter neoliberalism must go along with kind of opening up spaces for um, self organization for self, whatever. Yeah, let's 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 keep the rest uh, open um, and getting rid of a certain paternalistic um, approach to what it means to do politics or what it means to actually um, support and or to support infrastructure. And I'm a strong believer that housing is a public duty. I mean, it's not only a human right, but it's also like literally a public duty. So it has to be taken care of by the public responsibility, like by those who represent the public, but the public are also us. So we have to have this kind of multiple or like a layered notion of what the public is no? and and how kind of a, uh, but but at the end of the day it's um we talked about class we talked about race we talked about migration and these are all kind of high level um policy questions um that um that are at, where so much is at stake at the moment that uh, absolutely agree we cannot leave it to the people to actually squat land again on the edge of the city yeah. But there was power in that. We have a question from uh, Franziska Kramer. Franziska, please, you have the floor. Yeah. Well, hi. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to maybe draw the attention uh, on a mechanism uh, which has been described by uh, Martin Wagner that Gabu Heindl also uh, mentioned somehow, uh, which is the matter of the land issue. And um, as my, let's say, I maybe have to explain it very shortly um, that my research also focuses on this scientific discourse uh, on the land issue in town planning literature, let's say. Um, and I focus on a period between 1819 and 1930. And what we could see somehow, or what we can still see today, is that, um, let's say, land speculation and the housing issue are directly connected to each other, no? And um, I think what is somehow interesting um, and what we could maybe learn from that period and from the protagonists, let's say, such as maybe if we go even back from Camillo Sitte or Theodor Fischer, is that through this kind of theoretical reflections, a new approach on housing also arose. No? And I think uh, Marco Pogacnik also um, yeah, spoke about um, this relationship. And um, at the same time, I think we could see that new experiments maybe on aesthetic ideals also uh, came up. No? 
Um, so I would maybe like uh, to ask directly also uh, Marco Pogacnik on his opinion on this relationship between the land issue and, and housing and maybe Gabo Heindl, um, as I know that it's part of, of your work as well, I would like to know your, um, yeah, maybe um, opinion on that. Yes, uh, the relationship uh, between uh, the <clears throat> price of the land and the uh, price of the rent uh, is uh, a constant uh, thought in the town planning, uh, European town planning. In uh, Vienna, uh, in any case, uh, from uh, Otto Wagner and his position uh, uh, in in uh, uh, he he was he was uh, he was um, uh, favorable to introduce uh, an art of expropriation of of land uh, in uh, in uh, in the twenties um, um, uh, the uh, municipality of Vienna tried to expand the territory of the of the of the commune of the um, municipality of Vienna, and uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, Vienna introduced uh, uh, a lot of instrument. Uh, I mean, one is uh, VSB. Uh, 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 so, uh, that means they the uh, the uh, possibility to for the private uh, to gain uh, a public contribution was linked with uh, the uh, um, um, with the with the um, uh, the acquirement of the land because uh, you have to pay attention that the municipality have not to pay for the increase of uh, the price of the land. This is a, 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 is a very central topic. Uh, uh, you have not to pay with public money the increase of, uh, of uh, uh, land, uh, land price. Uh, this, uh, this was discussed in the Congress that I mentioned before, 26 in Vienna, and was uh, Discussed as a central topic, the uh, uh, the all the land must be uh, must be uh, uh, um, um, transformed in a public pro propriety. This was uh, accepted by all the uh, um, urban planner in Europe. Uh, Gabu, you. Um, wanna, yeah, um, and then, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but then we have to close after this answer. If other people have to add something, okay. they are welcome, but then we have to close since the end of, sure. the, of the time we have at our disposal. Thank you. Francisca, maybe we can connect afterwards and we leave, let others still kind of come in. Um, happy to answer afterwards. No, but you can answer. You, you are allowed, yeah. But I feel like it's like too much burden to have this last moment. <laughs> like, um, maybe we collect some more questions if there are. As you prefer. <laughs> are there some more questions? Maybe we have time for one. Questions, final, final questions. Final questions. Comments. Or comments. We have no more time for our questions. Even if they are, but they aren't there. So, if no one has anything okay. to add, I think we can thank all of you. A very interesting oh. discussion. Uh, we should go on for some hours uh, more, but we cannot. And so, uh, a good start for a, a long run reflection on the subject. Uh, there is a side I, I should have uh, emphasized, but I couldn't. That's the aesthetic one I have mentioned earlier. The, the, but someone has mentioned it too in some part of the talks, and so I thank you for that too. Uh, uh, if ya Jacopo, if you want to add something, if not, we can. Uh, 
I'm, I'm very, yeah, I'm very everyone. happy about the talk. I think we managed to kind of find a good balance between between very complex issues and and also the disagreements that were very productive. I think. Um, yeah. So thank you all. Thank you, Andrea and Annalisa, of course. But thank you to the speakers. So Gabo, Matias, Mati, Matias, uh, Marco, Ezra, and Valentina who is possibly somewhere else now, but it doesn't matter. Uh, this talk will be made, uh, it's, it's been recorded, as, as I mentioned, so it will be available. If you want to see again, if you want to have it, just let me know. I, I make, I'll make sure that you, you receive it. Okay? So, have a good evening or night or afternoon for Ezra. Um, and, uh, yeah, let's keep in touch. Yeah, thank yeah, you very much. Touch, to deepen thank the subject. You. Uh, I, I thank you. I, we remain for some minutes with the students, but uh, all of you, uh, the the discussion can go on. Thank you. Bye. See you next we time. We can leave I hope. The, the meeting. Yeah. Deep thank you. The subject. Thank you to all of you. Ezra, Marco, Francisca, uh, Gabo, sorry, Matthias, and uh, Jacopo, Annalisa. Thank you very much for <laughs> all your Ciao. intervention thank and you. discussion. Bye. 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 Nice to meet you all. Bye. Nice to meet you. Okay. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Bye. 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 Uh, io ho spiegato qui in aula il senso di questa apertura su una prospettiva che vi riguarderà più avanti nel, nello sviluppo del vostro lavoro di uh, formazione, soprattutto per chi farà uh, il lavoro sulla città che è previsto dalla magistrale in uh, service design, che è quella, una delle due rami della magistrale di uh, design qui a Bologna, ma insomma vi apre la prospettiva della città.